cool. Okay, right, shiny. So, I'm Chris Beely. I'm a data scientist. I work in the UK, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, I work in a trust called Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust. I work in the NHS, which I think is the largest provider of state-funded healthcare in the world. Uh, well, certainly one of the largest. Um, I'm sort of known for shiny amongst other things, hence why I'm here. Um, so oh, I already said all this bit at the beginning, so I just said that before we started. Um, basically, it's, we're going to do just two of the three sessions today. Do look at the session three in your own time on the GitHub. It's all there. Um, we're basically going to uh, we're going to build something very, 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 very simple, ridiculously simple. So you get the idea of it. And then once we've done that, we'll build something a bit more complicated and we'll look at some of the more advanced techniques. And I might just quickly summarize for you what's in session three, just so you know, you know kind of what's available and what's possible and all that kind of thing. Um, so what is Shiny? I think that's the first thing that's worth saying. Obviously, Shiny is the thing that you build dashboards, and I'm sure nobody is here who doesn't know that. Um, but the thing that it's important to understand about Shiny is that it's it's a web application programming framework. So whether you know it or not, you are writing HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Um, so as you write R code, that R code itself will produce uh, various bits of JavaScript, and, and it will all be seamlessly kind of tied together. It's worth knowing that because what that means is that you can actually mix HTML and JavaScript and, and Shiny together. And I don't have time to talk about it today, but on an advanced Shiny course, I might tell you about how actually Shiny is pretty good at allowing you to kind of have a little of each. It sound, when you first hear about it, it sounds like it'd be very complicated and Shiny would be very strict about saying this bit can be, you know, all that kind of thing. But actually, it's not. You can mix them very, very, very freely together. Uh, and that gives you quite a lot of power. So if you do know, web technologies, HTML, JavaScript, and all that kind of thing, then you can do a lot of stuff. Uh, for example, there are things that are easier to do in idiomatic JavaScript than they are in Shiny. So JavaScript experts, and I don't count myself amongst their number, will just write pure JavaScript for that bit. OK, so what does Shiny do? You've probably seen examples of Shiny. This is the this is the Hello Shiny thing. This is the thing that comes with the package. This is the most simple application that there is. And it demonstrates the principles of Shiny, where there is an input over here on the left. I'm assuming you can see my mouse pointer. Um, and there's a there's a graph over on the right, and you'll see that every time we move the um, the thing on the left, the graph responds, and that basically is the fundamental sort of way that Shiny works. That's that's the fundamental principle is that when inputs change, outputs change, and it gets more and more complicated the more and more Shiny you do, but you never really get away from that from that basic idea that when inputs change, outputs change. Um, yeah, and it always does this every single time. Is I don't know why, but it crashes my web window when I interact with it. So let's just refresh. Okay, but Shiny does obviously lots of, uh, you know, it, it does simple things, but it also does lots of very complicated things. So some people build kind of great uh, sort of statistical um, type applications in it, obviously um, drawing on the power of R to do all that kind of data crunching backend type stuff. And people also use it for all sorts of um, kind of flashy, uh, web gizmo type things. So this thing over on the right is a map drawn with uh, an R interface to a JavaScript library called Leaflet. Um, and this application actually rather nicely illustrates uh, one of the um, one of the nice features of Shiny, which is that you can get the the different outputs to interact with each other. So you can see this red point over here on the graph on the, just the, towards the top left uh, is this point over here on the map. Um, and that's you can uh, there's a there's a library that allows you to have crosstalk between the outputs. And again, I don't have time to talk, talk you through that, but I just thought you might find it interesting to know that those are some of the things that you could do. Um, it's all just it's all just web technology basically. That's how it all works. I've just noticed I haven't got the chat up, so I'm just going to pop it somewhere where I can see it. Yeah, there it is. <clears throat> Okay, right. So how does Shiny work? So this is the thing that you need to understand basically. So this is the thing I'm going to be driving home in this first session. Um, so Shiny works using something called reactive programming. Um, and reactive programming is not unique to Shiny. It's like a thing that exists elsewhere. Um, and it's that thing I mentioned already. It's the idea that when the inputs change, the outputs change. That's that's basic Shiny. Um, in the language of Shiny, what we say is we say that the outputs take a dependency on the inputs. So in this simple example that we saw here, this graph on the right takes a dependency on the, on the unit on the left. And it's all done automatically. I'll show you how that works in a moment. Um, but you don't have to tell Shiny that. Shiny just knows. And because Shiny just knows, that dependency is set up. And because that dependency is set up, when the inputs change, the outputs change. And that that's Shiny in a nutshell. Um, so just for those of you who 
I hadn't done much programming before I came to R either. So for those of you who are not kind of au fait with other programming languages, just might be worth just mentioning. Uh, it might not seem like a very important feature that, um, but in fact, if you look at other programming languages, so for example, Java, and I was actually writing some Kotlin, I'm trying to teach myself Android development. So I was writing Kotlin, which I think is quite kin to Java over the weekend. Um, it doesn't do any of that stuff for you at all. So it doesn't, doesn't set up a network dependencies automatically and the outputs don't automatically change when the inputs change you have to do it all yourself so you have to laboriously go across the application and, and explain to the application what does what um which is fine it's not difficult but it's just a lot of boilerplate code it's a lot of work and of course the more you write and the more you do the more likely you are to, to, to make a mistake so shiny just does that all for you the downside of that shiny is that that precise thing that it does it all for you so sometimes and i have a great friend actually who often sends me weird things he's trying to do in shiny that shiny doesn't really want to do shiny kind of does what shiny does there are ways of kind of tweaking it slightly but it, it because it, it because it works automatically that can sometimes be annoying and it can do things that that you don't want it to do um so for example database applications what's called crud applications i can never remember what it stands for create something update and delete i think um that can be quite hard. There's loads of, you'll find loads of people talking about this on the internet uh, because people often want to build databases in Shiny. Because the data can disappear before it's been uploaded to the database, Shiny is not, I mean, it's possible, lots of people have done it, but it's not a very natural way of writing a database because Shiny, to take it takes too much control off you. It takes it puts its hand on the steering wheel in an unhelpful way. There are ways of controlling the reactive dependencies, um, which I will just briefly outline later but again in a three-hour course we don't have time to go into details of reactivity but just so you know that although shiny does do everything automatically you can actually give it a bit of advice to say no i don't want you to do that and there are various ways of trying to control kind of tame the beast if you like um so just a very this is becoming increasingly more of a historical note really to be honest but i guess you know code never dies does it as we all know um so i just want to mention that back in the day when i started using shiny we actually used two there were two code files one was called server .r, one was called ui.r now that way i think is dying out now it lives on in the in the wizard for shiny as i'll show you um but for example if you look at hadley Whippen's book mastering shiny it's totally absent i don't think there's even a reference to it um at the same time more advanced things like golem which i use which again i don't have time to talk about but it's very interesting if you're interested um does have a two file approach so we haven't quite settled but anyway Basically, my take on this is Hadley Wickham does single file. Who am I to argue with Hadley Wickham? I'm going to do single file. So that's what I'm going to show you. But I just want you to know that if you see things on the internet, understand what they are. Um, it's the same, really. It's just one code file had the one bits in one file and the other and the, and the other one just has them both stacked on top of each other. It's the same code. It doesn't change the way the code is. It's just where it is situated. Um, so the server bit of the file is that's like the sort of the guts of the application. So that's the like the data processing and the statistics and the graphs. Anything that, the, that is being done to the data will all be done either in the server bit of the app file or in the server.r file. And the UI file is the how it looks. So it'll lay out all the buttons and widgets and graphs and tell everything where it's put. Um, it's worth noting in passing that the UI uh, section is run once and only once and then never touched again. And I'll talk a little bit about why that matters later on, but it's just useful to understand when you're designing applications, when you're debugging, and when you're looking at where data is, the UI is loaded first and then it's never touched again. So that means that you can't do some things in the UI file. You have to have a bit of a workaround, which we will talk about later, but it's just worth understanding that. Um, Right, so that's it. So that's how Shiny, that's what Shiny is. That's how it works. That's how you write Shiny. Um, so now we're going to get to the more kind of nuts and bolts of it in terms of what you actually write. Um, and so essentially, and I'll, I'll show you all this, and I think it makes a lot more sense when, when you're shown. Uh, and the, the Shiny widget does a, a nice, not widget, sorry, wizard, does a nice job of, of kind of laying out the boilerplate code for you. Um, basically, you define inputs. Obviously, your application is going to need to have inputs. There are lots of different types of inputs that all have separate widgets. Um, is it possible to increase the size of shared screen? Yeah, that's a point. Yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, maybe it is. Oh, yes, there. Yeah, sorry, I sort of saw that and I didn't. There you go. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so you've got the inputs and there are lots of different types of inputs, like there's text inputs and numeric inputs, all that kind of thing. And they're 
they're produced with code that looks like this, say text input and numeric input, and you give them all names, and then you lay out the 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 outputs of your application, so like the graphs or the tables or that kind of thing, and they all have names. Um, and then in the server file, that uses the names that you've defined in the UI thing to say, uh, you know, this table accepts this input from this place, and it, you, it mixes them together and does some sort of calculation that outputs this. Um, and then your UI then lays out those outputs on the screen. Um, and that's it, basically. So it's a set of widgets that, it, that receive data. It's a set of widgets that output data, like, you know, plots and tables. And it's something in the middle that kind of uh, mixes it all together with the names that have been defined uh, to show you how it all works. Right, so I'll show you. So if you just follow along with me, um, so I'm going to reshare my screen now. This is where I get in a model with this course because I end up with 15 million windows open. Um, so just bear with me a moment. Share screen. I've got a startup idea that there must be an easy way to this. You know, people who teach online, there must be a market for like making it really easy to kind of show lots of things because I constantly struggle with this. Right. That's it there. This is my shiny, this is my RStudio window. Um, so I'm going to make the text bigger. That's the first thing I'm going to do because otherwise you won't be able to see it. And I'll get rid of that. Um, I'll get rid of the extra con because that's not really helping us. Great. OK, so um, I'm going to show you how to uh, how to start from scratch, basically. And I would highly recommend that you st when you start from scratch, you always use a template. Don't don't kind of type it in. I don't know why you would do that anyway, but don't, because if you make a mistake early on, then you'll you might never be able to find it. So it's always nice to start with something that works. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So if you just go to file and then click uh new file um and it is uh shiny web app just here oh i tell you what no i'm sorry i'm gonna get a model on it because um this is also the training so i'm actually going to share a separate window um I'll share a blank R Studio window. <clears throat> cool. Right, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, let's start again. Share. Probably easier if I just share my desktop, actually, that would be easier. Cool. Okay. Um, oh yeah, extra column. Yeah, I, I live in I, I live by the extra column, but obviously it's not not great in workshops. Okay. So we're going to go to file, new file, and we're going to go to shiny web app, um, and just click that, and then it's going to bring up the wizard. And this is where I mentioned that the multiple file, single file lives on. So as you'll see, single file is selected. So we're going to leave that selected. Um, so we're just just put this anywhere. It doesn't really matter. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time on this anyway. It's just this is to illustrate the very basic, simple principles. So I might just call it test app. Create it in whatever direction you want to, and then just click create. And here it is. I wonder, I suspect the text, well, maybe I'll make it one, one bigger, actually. That might be better. So this is uh, what you will then be looking at. So as I say, I highly commend that you do this forever. Don't ever... Uh, not use the wizard. Um, there's some sort of rubbish at the top. So for the purposes of the workshop, um, I'll just get rid of. We don't really need the library shiny call either when we're using our studio because um, it'll be loaded automatically. So we'll get rid of that top just so you can see a bit more, more clearly what I'm doing. Sorry, my cat's just come to join the meeting. Um, so here it is. So hopefully you're looking at something that looks like this now. Um, if you're struggling, then do, as I mentioned you know, in the chat. So this is uh, 
this is the basic shiny application. So if I just press run app now, um, it'll appear. Sorry, it's popped up on my other monitor. Here it is. So this is the thing that we that I showed before on the slides. So this is this is the Hello World application. As you can see, it, it does all this. I could do it before. So let's just have a look at how it works. So this first bit here at the top, this is the UI. This is what I mentioned was that was the layout. Um, now, nearly all, nearly all, in fact, I think all Shiny applications will start with Fluid Page. Once you get good at Shiny, you'll start to be interested in why that is, and but it's not terribly interesting at the beginning, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but that does a lot of homework, basically. It does, a, it does a lot of setup for you that will be invisible to you unless you start thinking more deeply about this. Um, and then it's it's just put together with a few more bits and pieces. So there's the title panel command. That will make a nice big title at the top left, as we saw before. Um, and then there's only one more function with some more functions inside it, and that function is sidebar layout. So sidebar layout will be your friend early on when you're learning Shiny, because it's the most sort of generic, vanilla, out the box type of Shiny application that there is. So um, perhaps I'll just bring it back up again. Um, no, that's the wrong window again. Uh, so I'll just. Um, Just bring it back. So basically, um, the sidebar layout, what it does is you can see this is the title panel up here. The sidebar is it gives you a big gray box down the side that you can sort of type, you know, put stuff in, put widgets and date selectors and whatever else you want, what their inputs you want. And there's a big blank area over here for outputs. Now, that's not to say that you have to put the outputs on the right and the inputs on the left. You can put them where you like. Um, but the nice thing about this layout is this is a sort of this is what your users will be expecting to see. So this is a very natural way to write shiny applications. So as you're learning, you'll probably will just put three or four input widgets here and then something here. And we'll talk about what those something is can be uh, in due course. Um, so that's the layout. Um, and as you can see, the, the layout is actually itself composed of two things, one of them being sidebar panel. Sidebar panel contains all of the inputs. So there's only one input in here. It's this thing, um, but you can put loads of inputs in there, and, and we will do that in a moment. Um, and there's another argument, which is the main panel function. And the main panel function uh, it lays out everything that's on the right. So this thing, basically, this thing here says I want to use a common guard shiny app, uh, framework, and then shiny will say, okay, what's on the left, put it in sidebar panel, and what's on the right, put it in main panel. And that's how it's all put together. So now you understand that the, the layout, the next thing to explain is how it all gets stitched together. So you'll see here, this is the first argument to, a, to, to an input is always the name, the name that you're giving it. Um, so this is the, the name that, that R will use throughout to understand what this, what this is. The second argument is always the, the user readable label. So you can see, obviously, we've got a very nice computery name here. Uh, with no spaces and no punctuation, and we've then got a nice human readable label here. These other arguments, I won't go to them in detail because they differ depending on the numeric input. I'm just trying to talk about the principles at the moment. So you give it a name, you give it a label, um, and then you'll see when we go down to the server thing that, that that name allows it to be referenced inside the code. So if we come down here, you can see it's here. And what this is doing is saying whatever is in inside this input here I want that value to be in here. So for example, this value might be 37, in which case that would read 37. Um, similarly, this label here, this is another human label that we've, that we've assigned, is, is a reference here in the server file. So the server file is where you, amongst other things, um, define the outputs. So the output is defined by this, by there's a set of functions depending on what the particular type of output you want is, and we'll look at some of them as we go through. This one is a render plot because we want it to return a plot. You do have to get it right, otherwise Shiny it doesn't even fail with an error message. It just doesn't do anything. Um, so yes, so in order to, to reference here, so when Shiny goes here, it will say, well, what's in here? How do I know what to draw? It will go to this thing called output dollar sign. That's how all the outputs are defined, output dollar sign, and then the name. So it'll go here, it'll say what's in here, it will go to the server file, it will say, oh yes, here it is, output dollar sign disk plot. What's this? It's a plot. How do I draw the plot? I do this. And anything inside 
with an input dollar sign is a, is an input up here. So inputs are defined basically with input dollar sign and outputs are defined with output dollar sign. Um, and the last thing to note about this application is this is how the reactivity works. So I mentioned at the beginning that um, all these are defined automatically. So you can you can hopefully see that here. So the reason why Shiny knows that every time it updates the value of this bins thing, it should redo the plot is because it's referenced in here. So that Shiny will automatically see that and say, well, that value is in there. So every time that value changes, logically, this graph will look different. So therefore, if the graph looks different, I should redraw it. And that's how it does it. So you can have as many inputs here as you like, and as many inputs as you put in, it will form dependencies with all those inputs. So if you've got five inputs all referenced in here, the graph will redraw every single time any one of those inputs refreshes. Now that can be unhelpful, which we'll talk about later. Um, and yeah, and this this just basically runs it as I say. Just leave that alone. You don't need to think too deeply about what's in there, really. Um, you're only really interested in updating what's in here and what's you know in in between this bit here. It's very interesting all this stuff on the outside, but it's not worth bothering about when you're still learning. Right. So I'm not saying anything in the chat. So I'm assuming everyone's happy with that. I might just recap actually. I think that can be helpful sometimes. So just to just to very quickly recap, the UI is made up of this fluid page thing which does a lot of clever stuff in the background that you don't need to worry about too much uh, it's got a title panel which is a nice function that will just put a big block of big text at the top left it uses one of the built-in layouts the most common one the sidebar layout uh, which I, I would recommend you write all your early stuff with although we look at other stuff later um, and that sidebar layout has got two things in it a sidebar panel containing all of whatever you want on the sidebar panel which will usually be inputs but doesn't have to be and a main panel, which will contain all your outputs, which will, uh, which will, which will contain everything that's on the right, which would usually be output, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we name the inputs, and we name the outputs, and by doing that, it allows Shiny to understand this output can be drawn by looking for this output dollar sign, and this value here can be referenced by looking for input dollar sign. And as I mentioned, the reactivity is automatically set up because of the way the code's written, because this is referenced into here, it's automatically rerun. Okay, cool. Right. That's that. Let's go back to the slides. Um, so let's just stop sharing. And uh, and I shouldn't have, I'm just going to share my, sorry. Yes, I need to get better at this. I'll just share desktop two and just leave it open. Just put whatever I want to share on there. That's easier, isn't it? <clears throat> so My computer doesn't seem to be very happy today, which is not really helping. OK. Cool. Right. Yeah, so I've talked to all that. That would normally be behind me when I'm when I'm talking this in a workshop, but unfortunately we're not in the same room, so I can't really do that. Um, oh, yes. And then we're going to do we're going to do a little exercise now. So take the application that you've just um, the vanilla one that we, you've just sort of loaded with the wizard. We're just going to make a very, very, very tiny change to it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to add a title to the graph, and you can type the title in the box on the left. So we're going to define a text input over on the left on the sidebar panel, and uh, we're going to allow the user to type whatever they like into it, and whatever they type will appear um, on the uh, above the graph. So that's what we're going to do now. So as, as I mentioned before, if you if you feel like kind of just jumping in then please do just ignore what i'm saying um but just to keep us going and to help those who maybe um might get a bit lost otherwise i shall just demonstrate um so in order to do this we are going to um firstly we're going to add an input and the input is um let's just have it straight underneath uh, the first input and it looks like this. So as I mentioned before, the first value of inputs is always, without fail, what R is going to call it. So let's call it title. That's a good name for it. And the second value is always what your user will see. So let's write a nice friendly thing. Please add a title like that. Um, 
and that's all you need. So that will add a little box over on the left uh, that people can type into. Um, having done that, we're then going to add it to the um, to the graph that's drawn down here. I don't know if people really use uh, base R plots anymore. So I think it's a kind of a bit of a funny example, I think, this now, really, because I often teach this. And I think there are quite a lot of people who come to the Shiny course who've never used the hist function their entire lives. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's a bit weird. But maybe they'll, well, it's dependencies, I suppose, they want the dependency. Anyway, so just to make the point, for those of you who aren't familiar with base R, the way you add a title to a base R plot is with this main argument. And as you can see, it says here um, what the title is, histogram of waiting times. So we're going to get rid of that. We don't want it to say that. We want our users to be able to, to say what it is. So let's just get rid of that. And instead, so as I mentioned before, we can use the input dollar sign notation like this. And it's just the, the label that we gave it up here. So it's just title. I do think that's rather an obvious point this, but I do find it a good idea to co copy and paste labels rather than typing them because Shiny is very difficult to debug, as I'll mention briefly later. So whatever you can do to avoid silly typo bugs is all to the good because it can be very difficult getting stuff out sometimes. And that's it, I hope. So if I press run now, well, I think I need to stop it first because I think it's still running. So press run again. And here it is. Please add a title. And if we type in here, um, we can uh, we can see, hopefully, that it works. Something else just to mention in passing is you'll notice that every time I touch a key, it changes. That can be difficult sometimes. If it takes a long time to do the processing, sometimes it can be good to kind of slow the application down a bit. Um, that's something else I don't really have time to talk about, but it's something that's uh, worth knowing about, that you can get Shiny to just wait to see if the inputs have finished updating um, before. I only see hover details output. Hmm, I'm not entirely sure what that means. Um, Yeah, I'm sorry, Fernando. I'm not sure I entirely understand the problem you've got there. So this is the base on the wizard. Uh, we've added a text input here. And then we just write added main equals input title. And you should find that the application then will have a, a user definable um, user definable title. <clears throat> um, yes, but do I can come back to that if you if you if still have any problems then just just let me know in the chat. I'll keep going for now, but I can I can come back to that. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you've all done that successfully. Um, that's what it looks like. That's the answer. That's what I just did. Uh, I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm assuming you're all happy. Um, so that's it. So well done. So you've you you built essentially from scratch with the help of the wizard your own shiny application. So you're well on your way. Um, so having done that, let's uh, let's make the whole thing. Let's use the wizard to build the framework, but then let's get rid of all the middle of it and let, let, let's build it um, all the way from from scratch. So um, this is the bit where I explain the course layout to you. So let me just get my R window back again. It's over here. So many windows. Um, so as you'll see. Um, there are there's lots and lots and lots of code files in here. Um, it's provided part. I mean, it's partly to help you on the day, but it's also partly I provide all this stuff with the intention of helping you to do it yourself. If you know what we don't get to, and if you get stuck or whatever, uh, or even if you don't don't come on the course at all and you just want to just run it in your own time. Um, so basically, the way that this all works is like a common naming convention. So we're going to look at something called SIPREP first. So that implies two things. The first thing it implies is that um, there'll be a folder 
called sit rep first. Now that folder contains the answer. So if you get stuck or you you know want to know how to do it or whatever, that's where it is. So that stops you from getting stuck. But the other thing that it contains also is a file is a file called sit rep first dot r. That is not the answer. That is the code that you need to make the answer. So that's what you need to um, to get started with it. So that is just a sort of collection. It's not a shiny application. It's just it's basically a load of it's mainly server code. I'm giving you the server code because I don't. It's hard to teach shiny in a way because obviously you're trying to teach people dashboards, but you can't have a dashboard with nothing in it. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you shiny to output code that does something, and then we're going to learn how to uh, put it together between ourselves. Um, so that's what all that is. Um, right. Okay. So as I say, if you're feeling comfortable and confident, confident, then please just crack on and just ignore what I'm saying. Um, but if not, then I'm just going to just work through it now. Um, oh, sorry, I haven't demoed it yet, have I? I need to demo it first. Otherwise, you can't you can't build if you don't know what you're building, can you? Sorry. Yes, of course. Here we go. <clears throat> so here it is. Here's what we're going to build. We're basically going to build. Uh, this is a this is like a health example. That's where I work. I work in, in in health. So this is just an example of the number of people who came to different teams. I've given them. I've, I've mangled all the names because people don't like details being published um, on GitHub. Um, but there's a there's a big table uh, that lists by month the total number of people each um, who coming to the service in that month, and these are each of the individual services. Um, and the training is in GitHub. Yes, absolutely. Um, it would have said that in the email. Um, I'll just I'll just pop it in the chat for you. Oh yeah, there is someone started for me. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's that. And also uh, there's a graph and the graph does much the same thing. It just summarizes the, 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 the monthly attendance for each of those services with funny names over the time. Um, so that's what we're going to build. Uh, we've got some filters over here as yeah, we're going to filter by year. I'm going to filter by status. That status is like, did they come? Was it canceled? You know, did they cancel it? Did we cancel it? All that kind of thing. Um, and it uses the code in the example. So it uses this data. So you can just load this straight off GitHub. It uses these packages. And uh, oh, sorry, no, this is just the answer, isn't it? I'm supposed to be showing you the, the exercise. Yeah, so this is the data and the packages. This is the server code verbatim. You can just pay, cut. My idea is you can just cut and paste this straight into the server. I don't want you writing server code because it's just, just too many things that can go wrong. Um, but this is something that draws a table. Uh, and this is something that draws a pot. I'll talk a bit more about tables in a moment when I'm going through it. But basically, this is the table code, and this is the um, the plot plot code. And those are the the UI functions. I've just put some examples of the UI functions that you need. You're going to need a select input, which looks like this this thing here, where you can select the different values. Um, and there's a where am I? There's a DT output, that's a type of table output, and there's a plot output, obviously, which is where the plot goes. So, yes, with that, so with that example code and with the wizard, we should be able to build an entire application that does that from scratch. I will almost certainly make at least one mistake, but I'm sure we can roll with it. Um, just get rid of all my nonsense. Um, Right, so let's start again. So we're going to um, we're going to start another um, shiny application. So same same um, procedure. So we're just going to go to new file, oops, a daisy, and then we're going to go to um, shiny web app. Um, again, obviously you can put it wherever you like. Uh, let's just call it sit rep first, since that's what it's called on the slides. Um, and we're going to make a single file app. I mean, I do have lots of opinions about this single file dual file thing, but this is this is not the uh, not not the time or the place. Um, let's just get rid of this gubbins at the top because we don't need it. it. Just gets in the way of the workshop. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just getting rid of my nonsense from other sessions. Um, right. Yes. So here we are. So this is the this is just the the same applications again. So clearly we don't want this. Um, 
I would recommend this is obviously a slightly unnatural way to build Shiny applications. You don't normally get given all the server code. However, I would argue it's not super unnatural. So, for example, particularly within my team, sometimes people will, they don't really know Shiny. So they'll, they'll write our markdown and they'll send it to me and said, this is our markdown. Can you kind of make it interactive with Shiny? So I'll just pull out all the, you know, all the R bits from their R markdown, stick it in Shiny and then kind of just wire it up. So we're doing a process that's kind of similar to that. Um, so first thing to do is let's just get rid of all this server code. So we don't want this, get rid of that. And we're going to replace it with the code that I mentioned here. It's called sitrep first dot R and it's in the, um, in, in the folder. Um, so this one can just copy straight verbatim into the application like that. This is a table. And this is a graph. So having done that, uh, the first thing to notice is obviously these outputs are not defined anywhere. So Shiny has got no idea uh, what output table is, so it won't draw it. And Ditto it doesn't know what output graph is either. Well, it doesn't know where it is, sorry. So it won't draw that either. So that's the first thing we're going to change. So let's do this from scratch. Oh, my Slack's buzzing away in the corner. I'll just shut that down. <clears throat> so we'll just start from scratch. So we need um, two selectors, basically. Have I still got the shiny application? Yes, here it is. So we need a year. Um, oh, sorry, no, I'm not. I'm doing outputs, aren't I? Sorry, I got confused. Yes, slight confused me. Table and graph. So we're going to go uh, here. So the first one is going to be a table. Um, which is uh, DT output. Um, is that the right function? Let me just check. I don't want to get the wrong fun the wrong function. Where where are we? Where's all my windows gone? There it is. Yes. Yeah, that's a DT output. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we're just going to give it a name. And we've already got the name because it's defined in here. So again, this is a little bit artificial, but you get the idea. So that tells R to say, well, how do I draw this table? Oh, it's just here. Um, and then we're going to uh, have a plot. So that would be the plot output function. And we're going to give that a name. And we also, again, in a slightly unnatural fashion, have this uh, name to it. It's called graph. OK, so that's the server code added and that's the um, that's the main panel redefined to have a table on top of a graph. Um, so, well, let's just run it just for the just for fun, just to say it's not going to work. So we haven't done the inputs yet, but let's just have a quick look. Oh, could not find that function DT output. Oh, yes. Apologies. That's my mistake. Of course it is because I didn't copy the um, I didn't copy the library code in design. So the library codes up here. So you're going to need to copy that across, otherwise it won't work. I can just go right at the top. Um, oh, let's put the data in while we're at it. So this will also load the data in straight from GitHub. Like that. Right, now let's see what happens when we press run. Yeah, so um, it does run. I didn't think it would actually be honest. I thought it would crash, but it does run. But obviously we haven't set the inputs up properly, so there's nothing. It's not working. Um, I wonder if there's any error messages in the, in the in the console. Actually, let's just have a quick look, see if there is. No, there isn't. Yeah, that's a kind of an interesting illustration, that, isn't it? Shiny. I mean, I love Shiny, obviously, but Shiny is very good um, at not giving error messages when things are going horribly wrong. It just marches on. Um, Yes, it's shiny contact just a data. Yes, it is just it is just a data frame. It's not a reactive object. We're going to talk more about the difference between reactive and non-reactive data sources uh, in due course. But for now, we're just loading in a totally static object, and we're just going to interact with it in shiny. Um, right. So that's the first thing we want. So we've laid out the um, we've laid out the outputs. We've defined the outputs. So all we've got to do now, the only problem that Shiny's got now is it doesn't know what all these things are. It doesn't know what input year is. And it doesn't know what input status is either. Um, 
and uh, in order to define that, of course, we're going to have to, um, we're filtering um, by these two things. So this is obviously the year and this is the status. So uh, I'll just load in the, um, the um, data so we can just have a quick look because we need to understand what the data looks like in order to be able to write this. So it's where are we? shiny training. Oh, no, hang on. I can just start it from GitHub myself, can't I? I'm doing it. I like when you do that. I can do it myself. Beautiful. So here it is. This is what it looks like. So as you can see, there's a year variable. That's numeric, just a, a year, obviously. And there's also this status variable here. So we're going to produce uh, some filters that allow us to filter on those two different values. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to we're going to use the select input um, function. So you'll be using this quite a lot. This is quite a common one. And it looks like this. This thing here that allows you to kind of select different bits and pieces. That's what it looks like. So this is obviously very familiar. One of the nice things about Shiny is that you know, it uses the language of the web. So um, it's all, um, everything works as you'd expect it to. Um, so we're going to get rid of that. We don't want the slider input. That's no use to anybody. And we're going to find some select inputs. So, as I mentioned, always the first argument is the name that we're calling it. Again, slightly artificially, we actually already have. Um, um, defined, which is, it's here. Um, so, it's... It says input year down here, so that means by definition we have to write year up here. And then it's the user friendly label. So let's just do it like that. Um, now, the other arguments for select input, well, let's just pop up the, the, the help window so you can see. Uh, there's a couple of important ones, really. The most important one is choices. So obviously, when, you, when you're using uh, something like this, you have to tell Shiny what the options are. And you can list the options. Um, you can just say what they are. So you could, for example, write, um, sorry, I thought I turned my Slack off, but maybe there's something else chattering away. It's a bit, a bit distracting. Um, perhaps it's Twitter. I don't know. Sorry. Um, so you can just sort of list them out if you want to. Sometimes it's worth doing this. So like if it's like gender or something, you could just type them. Um, like this, something like that. Um, but we're not going to do that because that can be a bit laborious uh, if you've got lots of categories or you don't know up front what they all are. So instead, we're just going to, and I'll write choices uh, explicitly just so you can see it, we're just going to have the unique values of the data. Um, so it's unique values of uh, shiny contact data year which obviously will return those years 2016 to 2020 basically the other the values um so those are all the mandatory arguments. those three are the are the mandatory arguments so just to kind of illustrate i'll just run it now and just show you that it's not quite what we want just yet um because what that does is it gives you a control that only allows you to select one at once. And clearly often that's what you want. You want, you know, you don't want users to select lots of things because it it's not meaningful to select lots of things. So if they're selecting like county or something, you might want to just limit it to one. Um, but we're not doing that. So we're just going to set multiple to equal true. And the other thing you can do is you can also tell it what you want to be selected first. This is this selected argument. Um, I think it's a good idea to do this in this case, because often it, from memory, I think if you have multiple equals true, um, you end up, it'll it'll just be blank. In fact, I'm positive, I don't even know why I'm looking up, I'm positive about that. So when using multiple equals true, it's usually a good idea to give a default answer, just so the dashboard's not blank when it loads. Sometimes you might want a blank dashboard when it loads, it depends, but Often you don't. So let's just define the selected argument two, and let's just say select equals 2020. Oops, yeah, I'll just say 2020, yeah, okay. And then 
you can see this is the final thing. This is what we want. Where is it? Oh, I need to press stop, I think, with this. There we go. Yeah, and there it is. And now you can see we can select multiple things. And we can delete the ones that are already in there too. Cool. So that looks right. It still doesn't work though, because we haven't got the we haven't got the other bit working. So next bit. Um just another thing to note in passing, this can be a little bit confusing, I think, or it confused me when I started. You'll notice that in the output there are no commas. You just define output as this, da, 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 da. you sort of define them, you know, like they like functions. Um, but in the in the UI, you'll find commas between things. So in this sidebar panel, um, so there's one here that I've already put in without mentioning it, and then we're going to put another one here. Um, just worth just explicitly noting because you can trip over it sometimes and it gives you weird bugs. Um, so now we're going to have another select input. And we already know the name of this again, because this is just like this artificial example. It's status. Um, let's give it a, a nice label for humans. Then we're going to do the same thing again. Choices equals unite, unique shiny contact data, like this. Except we obviously don't want, yeah, I might just press return, actually, because I'm a stickler for the 80 character limit. Um, so this time we want to just check over in the data what is it we're filtering on we're filtering on status so it's just here so if we just run that quickly you'll see what it returns it just returns all the different types of things that can happen in an appointment well i cannot get my twitter to shut up whatever i press can i um like that um again we want multiple equals true And let's select something. Let's select uh, scene, just for instance. Um, okay, cool. So we've we've done it. I hope you've all kind of followed along with that reasonably well. I'll just do a brief recap at the end. So if I run it, hopefully it'll work beautifully. Yeah. So here we are. We've reconstructed it. Um, so these. Both allow multiple selection, uh, and so does this. And you'll see if we give it like an impossible value like this, it'll just do nothing. Um, there are ways of 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 dealing with with that because you don't. This is not a good experience for the user really being being allowed to to kind of make this kind of mess and then just having this big blank mess. Um, and there are ways of doing that, and I will I will mention that later on. Cool, right, so just to recap the main points. Uh, we built an application from scratch. We've loaded the data right at the top along with the packages. Um, we have, uh, oh, I didn't update the title. That was a bit lazy on me. Um, you probably noticed that all of you and changed it. Sit rep instead. Um, so yeah, basically we, we've pulled out the sidebar panel and we defined two new inputs in it. They're both select inputs. Select inputs have three mandatory arguments. Label, well, R label, like name, R name, label, human label, and choices. You always have to tell what the choices are so it knows what list to show. We've chosen to have it as being unique values of this of this variable because otherwise we'd have to type them all in. Um, we've added two new um, outputs. Um, table and graph uh, in the main panel, and they're just on top of each other like this. Um, oh, that's interesting. Someone's just written in the chat the unique and it doesn't seem to be necessary. Choices equals that works too and doesn't produce duplicate values. I suppose that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, okay. Well, I've learned something. Yeah, that's, yeah. I can see why that would work actually, because it can hardly give you multiple values of the same thing. Kind of that wouldn't make any sense. Cool. Um, Right, so that's the UI. Um, well, that's what we did, I suppose, the UI, isn't it? Um, yeah, and I gave you this, as I say, I gave you this. It's just, it's very, I'm sure many of you can read it, if not all of you. Um, it's just very simple code that just draws a table and draws a graph.
Unused argument multiple equals true. Oh, you probably got a, gra a, a bracket in the wrong place, I would think, to be honest. That's the usual that's the usual thing. I suspect have you have you missed out the bracket after unique and so the multiples crept into the unique? Oh, looks like a typo. There you go. So this is quite good at collaborate, isn't it? This is a big group, but this is going quite well. It's a shame you can't all kind of talk it on mute really, but I do think that would be chaotic. So but we're going quite well. Um right, is everyone happy with that? Does that make sense? We've all built a shiny application from scratch, so you're all doing pretty well. Cool, right, I'm just gonna crack on. Do anytime you want me to throw the brakes on, do just shout up in the chat. I'm watching it fairly closely, so I'll be right. There's, we're not really in a rush to get through the material, so we can it's fine to kind of pause a bit um and dwell on any issues that come up for people. Um Sorry, I'm just trying to find my window. Um, uh, firewall asset, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, computers, they're fun, aren't they? Um, right, back to the slides. Where are the slides? I'm trying to find the slides. I can't find them. They're uh, here. Got it. <clears throat> oh, they were here the whole time. Okay, let's not have two copies of the slides open. That's even more confusing. Right, so we've done this. So again, this is, to be honest, this workshop code is more for live because I would have it up behind me, but there's absolutely no point doing that today because you won't be able to see it. Um, right, that's kind of basic shiny. So you're all certified as like basic shiny developers now. So now I want to teach you like how to layer things on and, and do more complicated things in a better and more efficient way. So the first thing um, is reactive expressions. So reactive expressions are really, really, really important. It's probably the it is probably the second thing you want to learn, and that's why it's the second thing that I'm showing to you. Um, so a reactive expression is just like a reactive output, like a graph, except it's not a graph, it's a thing. It's like a like a data frame or a piece of text, or it's like something that can that has some useful status in R. It's very often a data frame, but it could be anything. It could be like a list. Um, and the point of having reactive expressions is basically it allows you to have all of the, the code, all of the server code that does all the data fetching and clean code and all this kind of thing for several different outputs in the same place. So just go back to the app that we, we, we've been building. Um, this is sort of, there's a big problem with this. I mean, it doesn't matter because it's such a trivial app, but um, you'll see the, the big problem with this is that we've done the same thing twice. So we've done this here and we've done this here. And that is just, that's how Shiny works. If you want to do something in an output, you've got to do it in the output. So I'm sort of repeating this code. Now, obviously this code is very simple and, and fast running, but of course, in a real world situation, you can have code that's either very complicated and difficult to maintain. You don't want to be copying it all over the place. Or equally, it could take a long time to run. So I've got server code that can take, you know, 15, 20 seconds if it's hitting a database. You clearly don't want that on four outputs. That's that's grotesquely wasteful your user's time. Um, and that's one of that's one of the, I think one of the fun things about Shiny is that it really makes you question these things because when you write kind of slow code for yourself, I don't. I just tend to write slow code and not think about it too much. But I just go make a cup of tea and come back and it's done. But you can't do that with Shiny because you've got users, you've got people who are using this stuff. And if they if they think the application is too slow, they will not use it. Um, so you've, you're in a bit of a game with them, really, trying to make sure that you're doing everything at the right time. Anyway, so they allow you to, to create and maintain the code in one place, which is helps you to kind of have, you know, code that's kind of neat and all in the right place and easy to maintain, but also they cache their results. So once they've run once, they don't repeatedly run again for every single output. They just keep the they keep hold of it and they will give it to several different outputs. Um, so yeah, so if you're using a lot of bandwidth or using a lot of compute, um, and that's the other thing that's interesting about Shiny, of course, as well, is that very often you're running on a server. So not only are your applications wasting your users' time, they're actually wasting the server's users. So you could actually be giving other people on the same server a bad experience. Um, so you, it, is a, it is a new way of thinking, I think, for some data scientists. So just to illustrate this principle I'm, I'm discussing graphically, 
this is kind of if you write shiny in a, in a naive way which is this is how i started writing shiny this is what you end up with so you might have a couple of inputs say i don't know like date or clinical area or something like that um and you might have a couple of outputs um and every time one of these updates both outputs will rerun yeah so this output has got all the code to make whatever it is inside it all the data and everything ditto this so if they're based on the same data object they're duplicating work and the same with this one when this changes these will both rerun as well so that's not what you want that's that's bad except in rare circumstances that's not a good idea what you'd rather have is something like this and so what you do is you just basically put this thing in the way this reactive um, expression that goes in the way and that forms a dependency and again this is all done automatically as i'll show you so that forms a dependency so whenever input one changes the reactive object will update and whatever input two changes the reactive object will update but it doesn't update each time an output wants to rerun so if you imagine this is the date you change the date the reactive object thinks to itself oh yes i need to change because the date's changed so let's rerun and then it will feed that on to all three outputs so these outputs will take a dependency on the reactive object so the input tells the reactive object to update then the reactive object updates itself and then feeds the same data without rerunning to three outputs. So as you can see, uh, very clearly, it's much more efficient. Obviously, not all shiny applications do this, but many do. Many have this big hulking data set that is passed around different bits of the application. And there's absolutely no point whatsoever continuously recreating it. Um, so that's why we're doing this. Um, all right, so I'll just pause briefly just to make sure everyone understands the the principle because now we're going to do it that that's that's what we do and why we're doing it i'm going to show you the code in a moment cool now everyone seems happy right okay so this is again this is sit second so in order to um complete this exercise we're going to um Sorry, I've got so many, uh, so many things in my, uh... yes, here it is. Zero seconds. So as I mentioned, the answer is always in here. Um, inside a folder called sit rep second and the sort of the, 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 the bits of fragments of code that you need to complete it are in sit rep second dot R. So I'll just open that now. I'm not going to show you a demo of this one because it looks exactly the same as the last thing we did. There's no difference whatsoever we're just making it run uh, more efficiently, more correctly. Um, and so this is what you need, basically. So you're going to need the first application that works. So you can either use the one that you just made yourself, or if you didn't because you got distracted or because it didn't work or whatever, then just go in the zip rep first folder and just find it and use that one because that's the correct answer. Might look slightly different to this one. I can't remember what I did last time, but it'll look something like that. Um, and then we're going to add this to it. Um, so this is all this time we're not touching the UI. The UI is all the same. We're just looking at server code this time. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to define uh, a reactive expression. And the way we do that is very simple. We just give it a name, any name you like, as long as obviously it's valid in R. And then we just use this reactive function. Um, and Yes, you'll see. So the reactive function obviously has got, oh dear, that was, I just didn't know on that, um, has got a normal bracket for a function, but there's also these little curly braces just to go around everything that you do. Because um, you might have like multiple, this is a very simple example, you might have a very long, complicated reactive expression. Um, and all we're going to do is we're going to take the data and we're going to do these common exercises as they already were, as they're done. So you notice in the first application, it's done twice. So this filter and group. Oh, and even summarize these first three lines even are done more than once on this. So these these three lines here are repeated. So we're going to um, we're going to do that once in the reactive expression. Um, and it's the, other than that, it's the same data operations. Um, and then once we've done that, we're going to then use the reactive expression throughout the application. Uh, and the way we do that is it's just like this. We just use the name and that will then return whatever's in here. So whatever this function here returns, 
will appear there. Now I'm just going to pause momentarily. Just I'm going to hammer this point home because it does create annoying bugs, as I found when I was learning Shiny. You'll notice this has got round brackets around it. Um, and this is important to understand now, but it's even more important later on, especially when you're using modules. This distinction becomes very important. So without brackets, let's just take the brackets out for a minute. This is not a data frame. This is an expression. This is like a way of doing things. So the analogy I always give is this thing here is like a is like a recipe. It's like a recipe for like apple pie or whatever. Yeah. So it's not a pie. You can't eat it. It tells you how. Um, and so it's no good. You can't you can't pipe this into the spread argument. It doesn't make any sense because um, it's not a data frame. But when you put the brackets in. It is. So the brackets is like saying to R, I know you've got a recipe for apple pies. Can you please make an apple pie? And whatever comes out of the recipe, you know, give that to me. Give me the pie. So this is the pie. With the brackets, it's the pie. Now, it probably seem like I'm laboring this slightly. It's just when you start using modules, you are going to be passing both reactive expressions and the contents of reactive expressions around. And if you haven't taken the time to absorb this concept, you are going to get in a horrible mess, as I learned through bitter experience. So, and also just remember to put the brackets in just as a simple debugging exercise. Um, I do think, I'm pretty sure you get the classic, um, what is it? Objects of type closure cannot be subset. I'm pretty sure you get that classic error. So if you see that in a shared application, that's the first thing to check. Have you got brackets for your right of expressions? So yes, not to bang on too much. Return data with no brackets is an expression. It's a, it's a thing, it's a recipe. With the brackets, it's a it's a, a thing that you can have, like a data frame or a pie. Um, and that's how you use it. So you just pop it anywhere you want that thing, and it will. Um, and again, it's all as you'll see, it's all done automatically. So this is automatically forming a dependency on on the reactive function, and so is this. But the reactive function is clever. It won't just run over and over again. It will just run once when the input updates, and then render TT will ask what's in it, and it'll say certainly there, there you go. And then render plot will also ask what's in it and it will give it the same object. It won't do anything else. It will just sit holding that bit of data until it's asked. Right, so that's that. So I think I've banged on about that enough now. Um, so I'm not saying anything in the chat. So do chat up if you're confused or you want me to reiterate anything. But for now, we're just going to do it. So we're going to take the application we've already got that works. And we just kind of kind of neaten it up a bit. This doesn't make it do anything else. It just makes it more correct. Um, I wonder if I might be able to pop this out. Actually, that might be helpful, might it? So I'll just pop this out, put it over here. And then maybe pop this here just so you can see what I'm doing. This this column's not terribly helpful, so I'll just slide it out of the way. Oh, that. So the reactor expression is defined as you might expect within the server bit because it's doing a thing. So we're just going to define it over here like this. Pop it in, doesn't matter where, where it goes. Like that. Um, and this filter group by summarize, this is the this is the duplicative duplicative stuff from earlier. So it's this. So it's going to get rid of that. And we're going to put it here. So now this bit does the same thing that all that gubbins down there did. So now uh, we're going to rewrite it. So we don't want, we want what's in this reactive expression now in this table. That's what we want. So as I mentioned before, it's a reactive expression, but we want the pie. We don't want the recipe. So we're just going to pop that in there like that. And we're going to put the brackets around. So that will say whatever's going on, go and fetch that and bring it back. And whatever that is, I want you to pop it in there like that. And then the exact same thing, of course, up below, um, like this. Uh, where does it go? Yes, here. Is that right? Yes, yeah, summarize here. Yeah. Oh no, I need to take the top line out as well, don't I? Oh no, first four lines, got it. Oh, is that common as well? No, there is no reason. Probably just because. Um, because I didn't notice. Um, 
Oh yeah, they both, they both, they both on group, don't they? Yeah, no, you're quite right. That's a good point. Yeah, let's do that. I suspect the real reason is because I added it later and then forgot. Um, but obviously, let's get it right. And I've confusingly got base R pipe and the other pipe metal up there, which is a bit annoying, but you have to forgive me. I'm sort of between, I'm currently adopting the base R pipe, so it pops up with the old pipe. Beautiful. So that's all you do. You just take your data, you pop it in a reactive expression, and then you use the brackets to return it wherever you want it. So hopefully, if I press run, I haven't just broken the whole thing. Let's find out. Yeah, so as I say, it wasn't doing it. It doesn't look any different because it's not supposed to. It's just doing what it was doing before in a better way. So that's cool. So we haven't broken it. Um, right. I think we're doing all right for time. So yeah, we've got another 20 minutes on this first session. Um, and... I might just pause. Maybe I'll just pause for like two minutes in between the sessions just to give your brains a chance to do something other than listen to me. Um, oh, what makes the base R pipe displays the error head? Excellent question. Uh, you need to download uh, a font that does that. Um, so the one I'm using, I think, is called Fira, F-I-R-F-I-R-A. Um, I'm sure there's a blog post about it somewhere if you uh, Google it. Didn't find shiny contact data. Oh, I suspect, yeah, sorry, I don't know where you, we need, I didn't probably specify this, we need this low data at the top. You probably just haven't copied that across to the new application. So it's up here all the way at the top there. So it's all the same gubbins that we had at the top of the previous app, otherwise it won't work. But yeah, so have a look, it's called Fira or something like that. It does a cool, um, getting off the track, but it does a nice not equals to as well. So... I do deeply love it. It's pretty cool. Um, right. Okay. So I'll just go back to the slides. Um, yep. Yeah, and again, this is all stuff I'd have in the background. Can you put that in the chat for the pipe display in the uh yeah i mean it's just the it's just the commoner garden um it's just the commoner garden symbols like this uh but they just automatically um change to um i think they're called code ligatures that's what they're called Yeah, here it is. Front. This is just a random blog post that I just found, but I will describe it to you. This is part of the fun of workshops, isn't it? I always think that it's fun to see other people's environments because they're often doing things that you're not doing that you want to have a go with. I often think that. Um, right. Okay. Everyone seems happy. So that you've you've completed successfully all the exercises in the first section. So we've got one more section to do after a very brief break. So now I'm just going to do some talking. Um, so um right debugging so i i will be talking a lot about debugging from now on um because debugging i mean much as i love shiny it, it's quite hard to debug i'm sure it's nobody's fault but it is um because the error messages well there's two reasons why it's difficult to debug the worst one is that the error message just are not very good and as i say i'm sure that's no one's fault um but it can be really hard to understand when you've got an error message what it's referring to like what outputs broken or and the other thing it does as i mentioned earlier is that sometimes well quite often in fact it will just not work but it doesn't give you an error message it just does nothing and when you're just looking at nothing it, it can be sometimes very hard to understand it could be all the way from something trivial like you slightly misspelled an output to something incredibly long and complicated and difficult with the data and it's, it's so it's hard to know where to target really um so because Shiny is so difficult to debug, I recommend a sort of highly defensive programming approach, particularly when you're learning. I mean, I still, I mean, I've been writing it for 10 years and I still use a highly defensive strategy. Um, so the first thing is start simple. Use the wizard, as I mentioned, always use the wizard. Um, and I mean, 
I suppose it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Only change one thing at once. Don't write loads and loads and loads of shiny code and then press run. That's never a good idea, ever. No matter how good you think you are, just don't do it. Um, the other thing to say is, and I see this very often on Stack Overflow, is people write code for the first time, like say draw a graph or whatever, in shiny. So they'll sit there in a shiny code file and they'll type a graph, blah, 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 blah. Then it doesn't work. Um, that's really not a good idea because it's very hard because because Shiny's reactive. It's like a sealed box. You kind of start it running and you can't look. It's not like working interactively in R where you can just look at the, you know, look at all the data objects and mess around with them and test if they're equal. To each other. You can't do any of that. It's just a totally sealed box that's just running. So debugging outputs in Shiny is never, ever a good idea. You never do that. Again, no matter how good you think you are, just don't. Um, just write it anywhere, um, you know, like in an R markdown file or an R script or whatever, and then port it across. I mean, really and truly, the, the, the right way of writing Shiny applications is you have thoroughly tested and packaged code in another totally separate package than functions that you call. Um, but that's kind of slightly more down the road in terms of trying to build very robust applications. I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the, the ultimate way of doing it. But certainly don't write stuff in, in don't debug outputs in Shiny. It's just frustrating. Um, there are ways of debugging Shiny um, that are not obvious. So I've t I think I've shown lots of people this over the years. Uh, people who can write pretty good Shiny don't know this. Um, so for example, you can use cat. So let me just show you how incredibly useful this is. Uh, as I say, I know people who can write Shiny who didn't know this, which I think is absolutely testament to how good they are because I couldn't do this. So let's imagine we've got an application and it's not working. Something's going wrong. It's drawing the wrong graph or it's blank or just, just being annoying. And we're not really sure why. Um, oh, let's not have this application. Let's, oh, where's it gone? Where's the one, the reactive one gone? Must be a different screen. Uh, is it this one? Is this the reactive one? Yes, here it is. Yeah, so imagine we've written this application and it's not working properly. It's doing something annoying that we don't understand. Quite often the problem can be in the data uh, or in the inputs for that matter. There's something inside either the inputs or the data that you don't know is there. It's either blank or it's garbled or there's something wrong. And as I mentioned, it's you can't just look easily inside Shiny. So what you do is imagine it's the, the, the table that's not working properly. All you need to do is just write cat and then you can just write anything you want to see, just write it in there. So for example, I might want to see what the data looks like. Oh no, don't, sorry, don't do that. Don't write cat return data, that's a terrible idea. Cat str return data. Just in case anyone hasn't heard of the str function, str function basically uh, just gives you a little sort of summary of the structure of an object. It's str stands for structure. So for example, just to illustrate, if I write str empty cars, it comes up with a nice thing like that that just shows you what all the variables are and what they all and that kind of thing. So clearly if we return, if we call this on a data frame that we're having problems with and we're not sure, you know, why, because obviously it's hitting a database or it's based on import or whatever it is, um, that will help us. So if I now press run, you'll see it shows you. So we can now see. So the classic problem is, oh, my shiny application doesn't work. Why not? You type SKR return data uh, in here, and then it will say table 57 by zero. And it'd be a blank data frame. And that's very, very, very common because you've set one of your inputs wrong. You put not equals when you mean equals or just, you know, the database is broken or, you know, something trivial like that, that Shiny will not easily tell you. It will not give you that answer straight away because, you know, Shiny basically doesn't know what's wrong with your code. So that's that. And you can also use it on inputs as well. Sometimes you're not you're confused about what the, what if the input's based on something else, you know, if it's complex, Sometimes you're not even really sure what's going into the application, no matter what's coming out. So you can use, you can do the same thing there. Um, so that's quite useful, cat. Um, you can use breakpoints in browser. I'm not going to go into what they are, um, but you can certainly, if you haven't heard of them, you can certainly do a bit of Googling. That's just common garden bog standard R uh, debugging. I'm just mentioning that, that you can use it. So for example, if you've got a shiny application and it always fails at the same point, just put a breakpoint just before that point, if you can figure it out where that is, 
and then it will do the normal thing that a breakpoint it will, it will just stop and you can just go in and have a look around it still can be difficult because shiny applications can run and this is something i mentioned at the beginning about doing things automatically shiny applications um run when they want to run like the the individual components um they, they do what they want so sometimes they can run in a funny order that you're not aware of something else is happening before this and so that can be confusing um so um but yes certainly that's um that can be a problem sorry i'm just writing um just writing the cat str thing in the chat Oh, no. Okay, so that's another way. Another way is uh, using what's called a re. Well, I don't. Know, it's I guess it's called a reactive log, React log for short. This is pretty cool. It can be hard to use, but it's pretty cool. So again, obviously you've got all the slides as well on GitHub and stuff or whatever. So don't you know? Don't worry about it if you're not kind of making copious notes. Just run this. So I'll just show you again. So go into your application. That's the wrong window. Go into your application and just run on the console shiny.reactlog equals true. That's the first thing you need to do. Now run your application. Obviously, this application works, but in this imaginary universe, imagine it doesn't work. And there's a particular point at which it doesn't work. So let's imagine that when I, I add a few things, I go, oh, yeah, that's okay. And then when I add DNA, let's just imagine the whole thing just explodes and doesn't work. So you need to do whatever's breaking the application. That's that's the key thing here. Um, and then you need to press Control F3. Firefox presented this side of an open pop-up window. No, please do. Uh, show this one. And when you press Control F3, after having run options dot react log equals true this will happen it's taking a moment to load for some reason i wonder if the r session is happy in the background let me just check oh yeah sorry no there's uh yeah the first time you run it you'll get a little thing that says you need to install a package to make it work am i not i've just gone up to our version 4.2 so my, so my packages are not loaded yeah here it is so let me just take it from the top for you so what this does is, yeah, so I just click this button right at the far left just to take us to the, because it will start at the, at the end. We want to start at the beginning. What it does is it, is it shows you all the bits of your application, how they all interact with each other. So you see there's a key down here. So green is ready to go. Orange is I'm figuring something out. Um, and these these two sorts of gray are shiny's not what, sure what's in those. So like a perfect, when a shiny application is finished running and come to rest, everything will be green. But every time you click a button, bits of it will become gray because they're like, oh, well, I don't know what's in that graph now because you just changed the date. And then it will all, the gray will populate through and then it will all go green again. So let me just show you, you can just step through it. So, um, so this is the first thing. This is it basically loading. Um, some of these are a bit weird. I mean, that's the thing is, you know, it, it's, so, for example, you've got all this client data pixel ratio. You obviously just ignore that. Um, and this thing here, just ignore that. I'm sure that's very important for somebody, um, but it's not important to me. It's never been important to me. Um, so just look at the things that you know what they are, like output, dot, you know, output graph and all this kind of thing. Then we're just going to step through. So you can see the first thing that Shiny does when it loads is it's like, well, I don't know what's in, I don't know. Oh, no, sorry. The first thing it does is it says, I don't know what's in this one. So it's gray. Then it says, well, let's find out. So it goes orange. And then it says, well, I can't find out what's in me until I know what's in this. And I don't know what this is in this either. So then again, it again, so it says, OK, well, let's work out what this is. And then it goes to the input year and it says, what, what's your value? And it even tells you on here what the value is, which I think is genius. So it says, the input year is telling me that it's 2020. And then it will go to the green one. It will say, input status is telling me that we're looking at just the scene appointments. And then you'll see now. Return date is happy now. Return date is like, oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I know what I am now. And then output table says, oh, well, that's cool. Well, I can work myself out because I know what you are now. So now it's gone orange. And 
I don't know what that is. Quite honestly, that bit. But as I say, you don't have to look at all of it. And then it goes green. So this this one's happy. Then the same thing again. Now the graph's like, well, I don't know what's in me either. And it will go here and it will go to return data. Guess all this weird stuff first. Let's just ignore all that. And you'll see, you can even see the caching. See? So straight away, it goes, yeah, no, don't worry. I'm green. I know what I am. And then that gets fed through to the graph. And it's all green. So we'll finish green. And that's really useful. Um, Partly just so you can see what's connected to what if you get confused, but also when you're doing more advanced stuff, you are sometimes sort of telling our don't do this first, don't do this until you've done this. There are ways, as I mentioned, about kind of threading it together. Um, and that can be tricky to debug without this kind of uh, thing. So you probably won't use it, I wouldn't think, if you were in early days right in Shiny, but as you get more advanced, I would just try and remember it's there. Um, Right, I've lost the slides again now. Why do I keep putting the slides? It's hopeless. Um, okay. You'd like an artificial intelligence program that just knows what I want to look at and shows me. Right, sorry, let's just skip through again. Blah, 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 blah. Debugging. Right, that's it for debugging. Is this the package you need? Yes, it is. It will prompt me. I mean, it's dead easy. If you do, if you do what I did naively and forget you haven't installed it, it will just say, is it okay to install this? And you say yes, and it will just do it. But yes, that is the package. Right, that's debugging. Um, okay, there is extra material. Depending on how long this course is or how fast we're going, sometimes I do the extra material. That I don't... Well, I feel sure we haven't got time to do it today, actually. Um, but it's here for those who want it after today. Um, so, oh no, no, I'll tell you what, no, I'll I'll just go through this verbally. No, sorry, I will go through this verbally, but we won't we won't we won't code it. We'll just look at it because this is really really um, useful, I think, for a lot of people. So, just this is just a quick um, summary. Um, you need. Um, this is all about non-standard evaluation. So I'm sure some of you will be very, very familiar with that. I don't know if you will all be familiar with that, but it's the way um, that that sort of variable names can get passed through functions in R. Um, and there's loads of stuff written online about it. There's loads of different approaches to it. There's It was bang, bang for a long time, the, the exclamation mark, exclamation mark thing. And there's a new way of doing it now. And I can't remember what that new way is called. Oh no, curly curly. That's the new way of doing it, isn't it? It's called curly curly. Um, so there's a whole, I'm just saying, there's a whole thing to this that I'm not going to really talk about. I'm just going to talk about the specific example of I've written a shiny application and I want to pass a variable name to a function from an input. How do I do that? Because people often stumble on this and I don't think you need to understand forwards and backwards non standard evaluation in order to do this. You just have to memorize what I'm telling you. So this is an example. So this is this is when um, this is when non-standard variation is not working. Um, so you can't do this. You can't pass in bare variable names to functions in this way, um, because it doesn't it doesn't know what what this what this is this gender. So it doesn't work out of the box. But what you can do is you can use curly curly like this, and then if you by using curly curly, R knows to pass it through. Um, and then this gender, this this bare variable name does get passed in here, and then it will work. As I say, I'm just, I'm not. This is not supposed to be like a full session on this. I'm just recapping. Um, this is the the nuts and bolts of non-standard evaluation is passing variable names. Um, so that's how you do it in in the common garden programmatic world, which is what most people are in. So most examples you see will do this. But the problem that we've got a shiny device is we're not doing that. That's why it's so confusing. Um, because we're passing strings. We can't pass bare variable names because, for example, this, the uh, select import, this does not return bare variable names. It returns strings and it will, that will not work. So that's no good. Um, so what we do instead is we do, we have a different curly curly. So this is the curly curly with bare variable names that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, this is our curly curly as 
either shiny developers or people who are passing strings for whatever reason they're passing strings. It's dot data, square bracket, square bracket, and the, the, the variable name, in this case, by, by equals gender. So we're writing dot data, square bracket, square bracket, that says pass this string through and then filter based on that as a, as a name. Um, essentially what it's doing is it's just, this is a sort of, this is like a, I think it's called a pronoun. It's saying, take this data frame and then just apply double square brackets to import a string in, which as you'll all be familiar with, that is how you return a column. Um, but it's just, this is like a special data pronoun that will work with whatever the value of the data is as it goes through. So it's kind of, it's like a special instance of data. Um, and that's it really. I mean, it, it, I think truly understand it. It's quite complicated. And I don't, as you can probably tell, fully understand it myself, all of it. Um, but I can certainly pass variable names in Shiny applications. And that's how you do it. It's dot data, double square brackets, the name of the thing, done. Um, and if you're interested in all this stuff, non standard variation, all this kind of thing, then I would encourage you to read curly curly. That's the best thing to read. If you Google curly curly R, there's a great vignette on Tidyverse and all that kind of thing. Okay, yes. So, and as I mentioned, this is the kind of extra homework that I leave sometimes. Um, so just have a look at that if you want to uh, in, you know, tomorrow or whenever you get the chance. Um, uh, there's one or two little exercises you can do that. Cool, right, that's session one finishes exactly in 90 minutes, which is promising. Um, I think I'm just going to just pause for sort of two minutes just to give everyone a bit of a kind of, I'm going to just going to stand up and stretch my legs. And then we'll be straight back into it with session two, which obviously has then got more kind of uh, advanced shiny type stuff in it. Is everyone happy? Does everyone want to pop anything in the chat before we just go on a very brief hiatus? No, okay, cool. Um, just for the avoidance of ambiguity, and I've obviously got no idea what time it is where you are. Uh, when the time has got a 35 at the end of it, wherever you are, let's meet back in. So it, that's four minutes. So it's half past five where I am. I've no idea what time it is where you are. But at 35 past whatever hour it is in your country, that's when we'll start back. Cool. Right. Thanks, everyone. Right. So this is session two. So, I mean, you certainly got the basics. So that's good. But we're going to keep going. Um, oh, can't skip the slide. Oh, there it is. Um, yes, I'm not going to do a recap because you did it two seconds ago. Sometimes I run this over multiple days, so I need a recap. Um, so we're going to build another whole application again, uh, this time looking at um, accident and emergency data. And we're going to be learning mainly stuff to do with the UI this time. It was sort of server focused last time. Um, just going to show you, this is more kind of like neatening up and making things a bit more streamlined and stuff. But this stuff is really, really, really important um, to, if you don't do this stuff, you, your application could be very confusing. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's worth knowing all this stuff. Um, so, yes, I'm not going to recap because I just did it. Right, the first thing we're going to do uh, is we're going to learn how to uh, have more than one output on the same page. Um, this is obviously pretty important um, because you're almost always going to want to have more than one. Uh, I mean, you can just stack, as we did before, you can just stack the outputs on top of each other forever if you want and have a really, really, really long shiny application. But that is not good user interface design, um, so I would not recommend that you do that. Um, instead, we're going to build what's called a tab set panel. Um, so let's just have a look at that. Um, I've honestly got so many windows open and I've got no idea what's going on now. Um, no, I'm giving, let me just on, it's probably this, no, oh, that's the popped out one, isn't it? Okay, so I want this one. Great. Yes. Okay. So we're going to change to a different A and E. Um, uh, sorry, different A and E. Different application now. 
and the application is called A and E Accented Emergency. So we're going to start with the A and E uh, first. So again, the answer's in here. Um, so let's have a quick look at the answer first. Um, so we're basically looking to build an application that looks like this. Yes, there's a deliberate mistake in here, um, which we're going to look at later. So you'll see it when it loads, there's a big error message that says fasting variables must have at least one. This is not a very good experience for a user. What R, in fact, wants you to do is select something over here. And once you do, it's happy. Um, but loading into that screen is not a good idea. And we'll, we're going to deal with uh, how to avoid that um, in, in this session. Um, so yes, what does it do this application? So basically, it allows you to select a date range over on the left. It allows you to select uh, an NHS trust, an organization um, with an A&E department. It draws some graphs. I mean, it's very stupid what it does. It's not a realistic example at all. Um, it draws some graphs of the, um, the attendances uh, to A&E in those places. And there's a little map thing as well. So we're going to draw some maps just to kind of just for fun, really, just because they look cool. Drawing maps can be a bit fiddly in R, um, but we're not going to worry about that today. I'm just going to kind of just show you how to kind of load it in. I'll let you worry about how to how to draw your own maps with your own data um, when you get back to uh, to your, your your daily work. So we're going to open the A and E code first file here. This thing A and E code underscore first dot R. We're going to open this. And that will show us um, everything we need to uh, make it work. Um, so again, there's loads and there's loads of server code in here. So just we just I mean I'm going to show you in a minute, but just copy that in because obviously there's no time at all to go into all the where's. I mean it's not complicated, um, but yeah, just 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 trust me that this data produces a reactive data object here, and then it draws a map of it and then it draws a graph of it and just don't worry too much more about it um what we're more interested in is the is the the ui so we're going to use sidebar layout here we're going to um put some dates in as in the original application we're going to have a, a select input which will allow you to select the trust um and then we're going to use the the main panel function to lay out the the, the tabs so I'll just lay on this on the slide actually uh, I think it's on the next one is it or is it on the previous one? Oh yes no here it says sorry it was on the previous slide um so what we're doing basically is we're building an interface that allows you and again this is just the language of the web so it's very familiar to everyone it allows you to select which input which output you want and you can have lots of these tabs all the way along so you can have you know graphs and tables and blah 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 all the way along um so we're going to write code that does that it's pretty simple it goes in this case, in your main panel code, you know, in a in a in a in a side panel layout, um, it will go in there. And all you do is you just have this two functions. One of this tab set panel, tab set panel uh, will draw the um, draw the whole tab set panel. It will lay out the whole thing, and then you put individual tabs inside it um, with each. Uh, with what each of the tabs is. So this first tab here will appear on the left. This label will be whatever the user sees it as. So in this case, it would be graph here. Uh, and then uh, you can write anything you like in it. You can have multiple, again, you can have multiple outputs in here if you want. It's kind of more natural to have really one output on a, on a tab, but kind of depends, maybe a few small ones. Um, and then the same thing again, you just keep putting all the tab panels you want into this is the number two. So in our case, it would be map. And again, you just put whatever output function you want um, and it lays it all like that. So relatively simple to use. Um, so that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna pop this code out again. I think that seems to work pretty well. Um, so I'll stick that over there. Um, and we, again, we're gonna start from scratch. Because uh, we've been doing a uh, we're doing doing a sitrep application up till up till now. Now we're doing something else. 
So let's just, um, yeah, that's right. Let's just put this over on the left. I think you should be able to see all of this at once, pretty much. Like that. Right, so we're gonna do the same thing. So let's all do this together. Same drill. File, new file. Uh, where is it? Shiny weather up here. And again, put it where you like. And I'll call this one A and E. Like that. And this is obviously the template you're now very familiar with. So we'll get rid of all the gubbins at the top just because it gets in the way. Um, I'll update the title this time because I forgot last time. A and E. <clears throat> right. So now we want um, a tab set panel with all the outputs in. And we want a sidebar panel with the date in and the select the trust in. So again, if you feel happy and you want to just have a quick um, quick go at that yourself, then feel free to just get stuck in. Uh, but if not, I was just wondering if I could pop this out, but I can't really. It gets too crowded. Um, if not, I'll just be I'll just be doing it here, and you can just kind of follow along and see what I'm doing. Um, so let's just get rid of all this stuff first because it's just distracting me. So let's get rid of that and let's get rid of that. So we work on the UI first. I think that's logical. Um, oh no, of course. No, we've already got the server, haven't we? Let's put the server in first. So again, it's it's a it's a bit kind of um, unnatural this because I'm giving you the whole server code. And obviously, in real life, you'd write your own server code. Oh no, we don't need to copy that top line there, do we? Like that. So paste that in there, like that. Um, and again, I forgot to mention this last time, we need to make sure we've loaded all the bits and pieces at the top. So we're going to load the packages that make it work and the data right, right at the very top. Like that. Cool. So we've got the server. We loaded the packages. We loaded the data. So all we really need to do now is just need to stitch the interface together and it'll work. So let's start with the inputs. So the inputs are, it's these functions, date range input and select input. We've already seen select input. Date range input is very helpful, very handy function. Uh, and it just produces these little boxes and you can just pop them up and, you know, I'm sure you all see these on the web. I mean, you can just kind of click the year and, you know, click whatever you want, click around and put, put the thing in. So that's what they do. So where are we here? So we're going to use one of those because we want the user to be able to select the year that they're interested in. And again, not forgetting, the first argument is always what Shiny is going to call it. Now, again, unfortunately, this is an artificial example, so you actually have to do what I did. Um, so if we look down to the server file, you can see we've already got a date input defined down here, and it's called date. So you'll have to call yours date too. Uh, and then a user-friendly one, uh, maybe date range, because it's going to be two dates. Oops, date range. Um, and you need uh, two more arguments. And I forget the names of the arguments, quite honestly. Let's press tab and find out. Oh, yes, start. Um, oh, no, actually, no, they're not. Um, Oh yeah, no, they're not mandatory arguments, but if you don't put anything in them, the start date and the end date are the same, which is never what you want, or very rarely. So we will put a start date in. Um, I've helpfully actually included a start date over here, haven't I? So let's just copy that. April the, um, April 2016. And we're gonna put an end date in as well. I mean, you could arguably just leave it to be today's date but that's maybe just a bit confusing for your user because they might think there's data there when there isn't okay so that's the date range input that will produce uh, a, a display which when it starts will start on the 1st of april 2016 and finish on the 1st of march 2019 
uh, and obviously we'll allow the user to select uh, values among it. There are some other arguments. You can like select the max value and various things like that, uh, but we won't worry about that today. Um, so we've done that, and then we're going to have another of these uh, select inputs um, that we've already looked at. I think this is probably by far the most common uh, shiny input there is. We're going to give it a name. Again, it's already got a name, unfortunately, so we have to just use whatever I've defined it as. It's here, trust, input dollar sign trust. So uh, we write trust up here. Then we might write uh, select trust here. And then we've got the choices argument. Um, and what I've learned something, so I'm not going to write unique anymore. I'm just going to do it the clever way. Um, so in order to do that, we need to just have a look at the data. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, let's just pop this window bigger for a minute. Right, let's clear out the old data because it just confused me having it in there and load the new data. There it is. Right. So we can just have a quick look. Um, so as you can see, there is a, a date that's called period. Um, there is a name that is the name of the organization. That is the trust thing they're interested. There's an org code as well, but it's just like a weird like three letter code thing that we use for administrative purposes. So we're not really interested in that. Um, so we just want choices equals a attendances dollar sign. Uh, what did we say it was again? A. <clears throat> and again, we want to set multiple equals true. And when we do, just to reiterate this point, because it's going to be relevant later on. Oh, that was funny, wasn't it? Um, oh, no, yeah, we haven't defined the outputs yet. No, I'll come back to that. Sorry, I'll come back to that. <clears throat> Where's my window? Yes, yeah. Okay, so I'm assuming you're okay. Do, do shout up if you're not. That's the inputs defined. We've got a date range input. We've got a select input. So now we're going to do the thing that we're, we're, we're trying to do, really, the focus, which is the um, the tab set panel. So um, it's down here. So this is this is a summary of what a tab set panel will look like, like a, like an example prototype. So let's just copy the prototype over. To here um, and then let's give them uh, user readable names so let's make this uh, let's have graph first uh, well let's do the functions one at a time actually that's probably best in practice isn't it um, don't really need the help code anymore so the graph and then we want to obviously on the graph we want to have what the graph is and the graph is called output dollar sign graph. So again, you're going to have to use my names. So we want graph output. No, uh, no plus output. Of course it is. Sorry, graph. Plus output graph. Like that. And similarly, we're going to have another one here. This is called trust map. Um, so let's just pop that in there. Give this a nice label like that. And just note this, I've written a few books like this. There's a separate function for leaflet outputs. You can't, it kind of looks like a graph. So you just think, oh, it's a graph. It's not a graph. If you write plus output there, and again, I don't think it even gives you an error message. It just doesn't do anything. And it's very confusing. Um, so don't don't forget any kind of special output, like leaflet, there's loads of, there's loads of different outputs you can have in Shiny. They all have different functions. Um, they all have different output functions. Um, so just try and remember that, otherwise you'll write weird bugs and confuse yourself. Um, and again, this label obviously is taken from down here. Um, I think that's it. The only thing just to mention that I haven't talked about because we didn't really look at the server dot, uh, server bit is just to explain what this it, what this date input's doing. So it's called date, as I mentioned. Um, yes, Twitter talking away in the background. Um, 
it basically it returns a vector with two values. So it returns so input date will hold date from date two. So as you can see, we're just indexing it by one two. So it's very easy to use. So it's just one object, and you well not I suppose you know it's, well, yeah it's it's a it's a collection of two objects, and you square brackets one for the beginning and square brackets two for the end, and that's it. Simple as that. Um, as opposed to there's just a normal date thing that's not a date range, which obviously is just there's no square brackets. It's just it gives you the date. So that's it. I think that'll work. Let's see. If it doesn't, it's all good practice debugging. Right, and again, it's got the deliberate error message in it. We're going to fix that in a minute. Uh, but hopefully when we click around a bit, it'll all work. Yeah, so there it is. Uh, and hopefully here too is the map. There we go, marvellous. So you built another application, and you've used a tab set panel to have multiple bits. Um, so that's the other kind of uh, tool in your toolbox. Um, Right, so there's nothing in coming up in the chat. I'm just going to push on. Um, oh, I've said all this. This again, this would be behind me in a real workshop. Um, right, now we're going to do some. We're going to do some more tricks with the UI. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do what's called conditional UI. So, oh no, <laughs> except the slides are in the wrong order, so we're not. Is it? No, <laughs> that's not great, is it? No, we're going to do dynamic UI first. So dynamic UI is very useful if you have a large number of inputs, but you only want some of those inputs at particular times. So the example I always give is I built a massive shiny application that looks at all of our patient experience data across all of our teams. And you could, in theory, have a shiny application where there's just a team selection on the left and it's just got every single team we've ever had in the entire trust for the whole 10 years of data. That would have like 400 options in it. That's not good user interface design at all. So we don't do that. In fact, what the application does is it looks at what other clinical areas you've selected and what the date range is, because they sometimes disappear and reappear, these teams. And it only shows you those. Um, so that's an example of what we call dynamic UI. And this relates to the thing I mentioned at the beginning, and this is which is why I mentioned it. Shiny, it, you'll recall, it loads the whole UI first, that's the first thing it does. When you press the button, it loads the UI and then it never goes back to that code file ever again. You can't touch it. And because of that, you have to wire up. If you want the, if you want the UI to change, you have to tell Shine, you have to tell it what to do. Uh, and it's not difficult. It's just important to know that that is essential. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, so this is how you do it. Uh, Let's, I wonder if I can pop this over on the on the side. Let's just maybe just come out a bit. No, I don't really want. I want to come in and go to the left, really, don't I? How do I do that? Stupid thing. Yeah, sorry, that's probably not the best uh, view. Um, <clears throat> so in order to do that, um, there's there are two functions. Again, obviously, shiny functions always come in pairs. There's always a UI and a server function. So the, the UI function is called UI output. And remembering that it's loaded first, what that says, what that says to Shiny is, there's something in here, but I can't tell you what it is yet because I haven't run the server file. So just put, put a, please put a blank space here. And then once the server file runs, you will know what's in there. You can put it in there. And that's obviously the way, that's the method of making it dynamic because now the server can update it. So you're telling the server, you feed your operations back to that piece of UI. So that's that, that's the trick to make it dynamic. And the, the companion function to UI output is render UI. And when you use render UI, you again, obviously, as always, use output dollar sign. So the output dollar sign is this thing here, as you can see here, date range UI. And then inside render UI function it is very easy to use. It is just absolutely common regard and plain UI code. There's nothing special about it at all, except that you can do dynamic type stuff. You can have reactive values in there. I haven't done that because I'm, I'm a bit cautious about 
putting loads and loads and loads of code in and confusing everybody. Um, but I'm just trying to explain the kind of the layout to you, really. This can do anything you like. It can have reactive values. It can have seven reactive values. It can hit databases. It can do anything. It can do all the stuff that you cannot do in a UI. Uh, but we're not going to write loads and loads and loads of complicated code today because there's really no point. Um, note well that what comes out of this, the date, will be referenced elsewhere in the server as input dollar sign date. It uses this identifier here, not this one. This identifier is used to put it on the screen. This identifier is used to return the value. I'm just telling you that because that can also be a bit confusing and it tripped me up a few times. Uh, because of that, I've come up with a system where whenever I have a UI output, I always write UI in capital letters at the end because it stops me from getting confused. Because if I had something in my thing that said date range, I would start, get confused and start thinking, oh, that's what it is. It's date range. And I write input dollar sign date range and Chani wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about because that's an output, not an input. Um, so that's just a little piece of advice. You can, if you wish, you can copy me and just put some sort of thing here because you can write a lot of this. You know, if you write a big application, you can have like 20 of these easily. So it can get very, very confusing what, the, what everything is. So I would recommend that you have some sort of clever boilerplate way of telling them apart. Um, but other than that, that's it really. Um, so let's do that now. Uh, do you want me to make, these, make this window a bit bigger? Let's see. Let's see if I can just do it over here. So perfect balance between having enough space on the screen and you be able to actually read it. So, yeah, so it's very simple. If you want to replace um, non-reactive, non-dynamic UI with dynamic UI, all you do is you just say where you want it to go. So like here, UI output here, and then you just write, as I say, and I always write UI at the end like that. And then all you need to do is you just need to move whatever you've got here down to here. So this will now go in, a, in an output function, output dollar sign date range UI. This gets render UI. Normal bracket, curly bracket, it just goes in there just like that. And that's it. Oh, I know is I have done something here, right? I suppose to kind of in an effort to illustrate it, but this is still this is still not reactive. You can still actually run this at the top. I suppose I was just trying to illustrate the point that you can carry out data operations. Um, but that's not, not arguably not a brilliant way of illustrating it because uh, Actually, that would still run in the UI, but I'm just trying to show you the, the kind of structure of it, really. So let's just do that. Why not? So now it'll just look at the look at the range of the data. Like that. OK, let's just make sure we haven't broken it. Oh, we ha definitely have because there's an error. Oh, yeah, is that just the comma? Yeah, I think it is. <clears throat> oh, no, stop the thing first. It's kind of interesting, actually, just to slightly go off on a slight tangent. Someone mentioned before about writing or not writing unique in the chat. I don't think Shiny actually likes that very much. I don't know what exactly what the problem is. But if you look up here, it says warning the selective input has a large number of options. So I think what's happening is that, that R is dumping the whole thing to that control and then that controls JavaScript or something is somehow pulling through them. And that's maybe not a good idea. I don't, I'd have to, I don't know enough about it, but maybe it doesn't like that. And actually it's, it will be slower in a, in a larger, more complicated application. Actually that would slow down. So that's just an interesting um, thing. All these error messages here, I'm pretty sure just because of the deliberate mistake, but let's just check. Yes, they are. So you can see now they've disappeared. Um, yeah, so look, I mean, here's some, well, I'm sure you've probably seen some error messages maybe today already, but here's some, um, here's some shiny error messages. They're not, 
they're just not very easy to read. It's hard. They've got lots of stuff in it that you don't know what it is, and it's not always obvious. I mean, it does at least say output graph there, to be fair. So you, 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 you're slightly onto the right track there, aren't you? But I, I do think it, it can be confusing. <clears throat> right, that's that. Everyone happy? Anybody not happy? Cool. Okay. Um, so that's Dan Amino. That's a pretty powerful tool, that. So um, that's another good thing to know about. Okay, so some more UI type stuff. Um, so this is um, this is not dynamic UI, but rather conditional UI. Um, so conditional um, conditional UI, as it's called in in China, it's called conditional panel, is very useful in an application like ours. Uh, let me just show you why. Where has it gone? Is it here? Oh, I think I killed the application. Sorry, just a minute. Yeah, so in this application, it's very useful to have conditional UI. And the reason for that is because when you go to the map, this control doesn't do anything at all. You can press these buttons as much as you like. And nothing will happen because this map shows all, all of the organizations. So this is not, this is not, this is kind of user interface territory. It's never a good idea. Well, it's rarely a good idea to show a user a control that in the current situation that they find themselves in doesn't work because what they'll press it and be confused as to why it's not working. So it's a good, it can be a good idea to clean that stuff out of the way. So they're only looking, they're only ever looking at stuff that, that does something. Like if this button's on the screen, if you press it, something will happen. It might not be interesting. So for example, if I you know play around with this, nothing fantastically, amazingly interesting is going to happen if I wind it on a few months. But something happens. It, it, it's different data. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a key principle, really. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so conditional panels are very easy. There's a function in R called uh, conditional, well, in shiny, sorry, called conditional panel. Um, and it has two arguments, basically. One of them is a condition that you're testing for, like, is this true or not? Um, and the other one is just whatever you want to appear in the control. So in this example, it would just be this. This control, as you can see, would go inside the conditional panel. Now, this condition. It, this is a little bit intimidating, or I find a bit intimidating when I started with Shiny, because I was quite naive to web stuff back in those days. It is quoted JavaScript. So you in there, you write JavaScript and you put quotation marks around it. Now, if you don't know JavaScript, that might sound a bit frightening. And to be honest, depending on what you're doing, it can be a bit confusing, if I'm honest. I've had to Google JavaScript a couple of times to understand exactly how to express what I want. But the simplest form of it, which is what I want to show you, it's very simple. So in its simplest form, all you do is you just replace the, the dollar sign with a dot and then just test for something. So that will work. That R and JavaScript are similar enough that that will work, that you can write input dot my input double equals whatever, and that will work. If you're doing things like testing for membership or there's some other functions that don't really work and are a bit confusing, but you know, I advise you just to stay away from those as you're learning. Um, and basically, whenever this evaluates to true, this will appear. And whenever it evaluates to false, it will disappear. And obviously, it will be dynamic. So as your user, as that value becomes in and out of being true, it will appear and disappear. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, so let's just pop this over here. And we're going to move. Um, we're going to move the um, the trust selector. This thing here, where you can select the organisation you're interested in. We're going to put that inside a conditional panel, 
and we're going to test to see what the user's looking at. This is quite a common thing. So when the user's looking at this, we want them to see it. But when they're looking at this, we want them not to be able to see it. Um, in order to do that, we have to add one more thing to the application itself, uh, which I didn't add early on just to avoid drowning with arguments, but which uh, can import, become important later on, is we're going to add an argument to tab set panel that allows us to test for it. And if I'm being completely honest, I always forget what it is. Uh, well, not always, but often. I think it's ID. Let me just have a quick look. Yes, ID. So we're just going to write ID equals, and just call it, and it doesn't really matter what you call it, tab set. Just in case you got more than one tab set, that's all. Just call it something. And because you've done that, that allows you to test for it, uh, to test for what they're looking at. Um, and um, you need, therefore, to add. So this has got an ID. Yes, precisely. The, into the to the question in the chat. Yes, that's exactly that's exactly right. Yes. Um, so we're just going to add another argument as well to the tab panels because we need to tell R what they're called. Um, let me just use tab complete because I'm, yeah, it's value. I, I get the model up. That's that's why I get confused. So this is ID. This is value. So we're just going to call this graph. And we're just going to call this. Um, and that allows Shiny to know what's what. Um, so basically, it just becomes um, import dollar sign tab set will take values. Um, so when um, I might just type it on the screen so you can see it. So when you're looking at the graph, import dollar sign um, tab set will equal graph. I don't know why I'm typing it in the console. That's going to cause R to go very strange. Let's not do that. Let's just start a new code window. And when you're looking at uh, input dollar sign map, I mean, when you're looking at the map, input dollar sign map will be graph. So that allows you to test for it. So you can now test these values and see. Oh, sorry. Oh, dear. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not concentrating. Input dollar sign tab set. So you're always testing this one thing, input tab set, but it takes different values depending on what you're looking at. And these are values that we've set here, except I forgot to write value equals. I'm trying to do too much stuff at once. There. So when we're looking at this, input dollar sign tablet set equals graph. When we're looking at this, input dollar sign tab set equals map. But as I say, just to slightly confuse things, we have to write it quoted JavaScript, but it's not as bad as if you don't speak uh, JavaScript, it's not as bad as it sounds. So let's just have a go now. So all we're going to do is we're just going to add a conditional panel like that. And we're going to write what the condition is. Condition equals quotes. And then it's input dollar sign tab set equals uh, uh, right, hang on, I need to think about it. Do we want it to show it or hide it? So when input dollar sign is true, is is graph, we want to show it. Yes, yeah, so it's graph, isn't it? Yeah. Um, like that. Condition equals input dollar sign input dot tab set equals graph. And then we just pick up the whole thing. It will just run out of the box. There's no need to change the code. We just put it in there like that. Just tiny my code up a bit, so it's taking the less room. That's it. Let me just check, see if I haven't broken it. Just correct the deliberate mistake. Right, so here it is. And then we go to the map, and it disappears. So obviously your applications, you know, will be more complicated than this, but this is a general principle of user interface design is only show them what they're interested in and what, what, what works. You'll have the quotations in the input. 
Oh, here? I did that deliberately. Is that what you meant? Or did I just do something stupid? Oh, right, yes. Good. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. So the reason is because um, that's what this returns. So you're setting value equal to a string. So input dollar sign tab set will equal this string. Equally input dollar, dollar sign tab set will equal map if you look at the other one. So they are strings. You very often, that's the thing about shiny. That's why I mentioned the thing about non-standard evaluation. Lots of things are strings because the stuff that um, the stuff that comes out of controls, you know, select input controls and stuff like that is all strings. So that's why. Cool. OK, right. I'm assuming everyone's happy unless I hear otherwise. Um, right. Conditional panel. OK, cool. Right. Um, so the next thing is. Oh, I've broken it. Will, it. will it appear? Oh, no, I think you can. I think you can. I just did it that way because I just always do it that way. I'm just, you know, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. Let's find out. Oh, it's, it's trying to help me, but it's not helping me. It's just confusing me. Yes, like that. Let's try. <clears throat> yeah, that's no, all good. Yeah, don't mind. <clears throat> right. Okay. So the final thing is, oh, I've just broken it again. So uh, we're going to deal with this error message that we've been looking at uh, all afternoon or morning or wherever you are. So when it loads, it looks like this. This is not a good experience. This is an R, you know, this is R talking to the user. You don't really want R talking to the user because unless they speak R, they don't know what fasting variables are for one thing. It's it's not a good experience. It also makes the application look like it's broken. And that's the other thing I was saying before about shiny development being different to normal development is that, you know, when you're writing your own code, you've got a pretty way of whether it's broken or not, but your user doesn't. So your user might think, oh, this is rubbish and just quit. Um, so we don't want this. So what we're going to do instead, there are two ways of dealing with this, and they both work really well for the particular thing that they're designed for. Um, the first one is RAQ, um, which is, I'm guessing must mean require. I'm sure it must stand for require. Um, and so what that will do, what require will do, is it will it will not run a block of code until whatever is inside it takes a valid value. So it doesn't return anything or do anything or make any error messages or crash or hit a database. It does nothing at all. Um, and that can be incredibly useful because sometimes actually you have to put these in because otherwise your application will just grind to it will actually crash. So this isn't necessarily just about good user experience. Sometimes it can stop your application from actually killing itself. Um, so that's really important. Um, so that's require. Validate is a bit different. Validate will do, it does exactly the same thing. It will it will draw the code to a screeching halt, um, but it will also write a nice error message, which is more what we want in this case. I'm going to show you both. But I think it's it's uh, most people would agree that um, it'd be better if we said, you know, oh, you need to select a trust uh, rather than just having a blank screen. But we'll do it both ways. So um, we're going to go on to the next code file now. So let me just make my window a bit bigger. Oh, maybe I don't need a window bigger. Though. I don't know. Let's see. Um, Okay, A and E second is here. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have said it didn't actually. Yeah, so the answers for the previous stuff that we were doing in this area as well, I forgot to mention that. Um, and we've done it now. But yes, it, it, there it was the whole time. Um, so we're only interested in now in these bits at the bottom um, that are about uh, either validating your code or requiring your code. 
Um, so let's do require first. Let's pop this out again. Um, I think we probably will finish a little tiny bit early, actually. Um, we could maybe just have a quick chat if people sometimes want to ask about kind of hosting and like that kind of thing. We could maybe have a quick chat about that at the end, or you can all just go about your days. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I'm just giving you a, a pre-warning. Um, I think it's it's not as interactive as it often is, this, uh, this thing. So I'm sort of amazed that I've done it all in three hours, but um, obviously everyone's sort of just cracking on. So anyway. Right, let's let's get rid of that horrible error message. So um, let's do use require first because that's the simpler one. So um, basically, we're going to want it. Um, am I looking at the right code file? Let me make one never because it's confusing me. Um, Yes, so we're going to want it. Oh, is there no? Oh, I see. Oh, of course, because yeah, sorry, I was just I'm just working through there. Yeah, I was just a bit confused because I wasn't sure where the filter even was because it's not in there. But of course, it's not in there because that goes to the to the map, which doesn't filter by trust. It's down here. Yeah. Of course, right. So yeah, so when when input dollar sign trust does not have a value, basically, we don't want to run the plot because the plot will not run because it's got this filter in. So it will try and filter something that doesn't exist and fall over. So we're just going to write req brackets and then we're going to write input dollar sign trust. Um, just to briefly mention. Um, so req, um, it will check for what Shiny calls like valid values, and there there are there are several sorts of um, uh, well, I suppose they're more correctly called truthy values actually rather than valid values. Um, I'm just think there's a list in here, so I'm just trying to find it for you. Um, I'm sure it's in here somewhere, uh, or maybe it's it is truthy actually. I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so a value is truthy unless it is one of these things. So this is what you're testing for, really. Most of them are pretty obvious. Some of them are kind of things that you wouldn't really expect, but you kind of when you see them, you, you can understand why they're there. So we're checking basically, does import dollar sign trust equal anything at all except for false, null, empty string, empty vector, a non-empty vector that contains only missing values, a logical vector that's all false, an error, or an unclicked action button. I don't really have time to talk about action buttons. That's a, it's a way of allowing a user to decide when the application runs, basically. So it makes sense that you wait until they've clicked it and then run it. But I, I won't go into all that now. Um, so this is very useful. This this is this is based on the is truthy function. I really like the truth function. I actually use it, I think, outside of Shiny. It's really cool because whenever, often when you're writing things, you don't, you can have strange things come through from database and stuff like that. So sometimes it could be null or an empty string or just a lot of, like, a lots of missing values, all this kind of thing. Um, and that can be very annoying to test for. Like, is it null? Is it this? Is it the other? Blah, blah, blah. And what this is truthy function allows you to do is just say, if it's any of those, I'm not interested. So it's false or null or what, I don't care. Uh, and that's very often works for whatever you want. Um, so that's the is truthy function, and uh, it's sort of it's being called in the background essentially by a require. So it requires checking that it's not one of those values. And as you can see, when the application is loaded, it is one of those values. Um, I, I think an empty multiple select off from memory is null. I'm not entirely sure. I wouldn't bet my life on it. It might be empty string, but I'm pretty sure it's null. Um, so that's what we're testing for, basically. Is it null? Is it an empty string? Is it false? Um, so if I run the application, um, uh, 
we can see here now the error message has disappeared. So it's not doing that annoying thing where it's confusing people with horrible red messages, but equally well. Um, I mean, I say this this function is incredibly useful, but it, not particularly in this case. Uh, clearly, I think validate is better here. But just to stop the application from straight up, you know, either wasting time or crashing or doing something weird, require can be really useful. So now we've done that, let's let's do the same thing again with validate. Um, so the validate code is just here. So we're going to get rid of this. And we're going to use validate. And I've lost the thing now. Let's just move my window over to the left. So validate is a bit different because it actually contains a function itself. And that function is need. The reason why it includes need is because you could have multiple needs, which again is very, very helpful. So you don't have to write loads and loads and loads of validates. You can just write one and you can say, I need date to have a value value, I need trust to have a value value, I need blah, 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 whatever. You can test for as many things as you like. And every time you write a need statement, um, you then write an error message that goes with the need statement. So I'm only going to write one. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. Is it called trust? Oh yeah, trust, that's it. So we just write, so we write validate around the need and then we write the need and we say, what do we need to be true? Or, you know, what do we need to have a proper value in it? Input dollar sign trust. And if it doesn't, what should we say to the user? Um, and then we might just write, so please select trust. Like that. And as I say, you can have multiple of those. Um, I don't really think, I don't think I can do a, a sensible example to show you the multiple ones, but just to take my word for it that you can just put them on, they've got a lot of different errors. Oh, let's push the error out, why not? Let's just write one that's a bit weird. Uh, need input date, um, let's say greater than uh, 2017. Uh, one and then let's put an error message too much data so this is not really a particularly sensible example but uh it will run at least i think right now let's try it stop first <clears throat> Oh yeah. Oh well, I just deleted it all. That was not. That was not a sensible thing. Oh yeah, now I've got too many, uh, too many things on there. <clears throat> Yeah, and this is the thing I really like about validate is actually it will give you multiple at the same time, even, which I think is uh, which I think is highly useful. So at the moment it's saying there's two things I'm not can't show you anything until you sort yourself out. So I select to trust, and now it's saying too much data. So I think well okay well let's uh, I mean obviously this is not a sensible example as I mentioned, but let's um, let's just wind forward a bit to 2017 and there it is. Um, Yes, and as I say, you can have as many of those as you like. Um, as you can see, and they're kind of slightly different examples, these aren't they? So this is just testing, does an input contain a thing? And this is testing the slightly more sophisticated example of, does that input meet some pre-specified criterion of I have, like, for example, you know, what the date is or all that kind of thing. Um, so you can obviously do some very, very sophisticated things where, and you do, you might do this. So for example, you might want an application that processes no more than 10,000 rows at a time. Uh, either because the user will have to wait too long, it will crash the server or whatever. Um, so you could do that. You could have the application say, I'm sorry, I can't process this as much data. It's too much. You'll have to constrain more and then I'll do it for you. That might be a good example of where you might have quite a, a couple of lines of code just checking that everything's um, right, bidding the missing ones and you know whatever it might be. 
Right, okay, that's following it required. So anything in the chat from anybody wants any more clarification about that? Cool. Oh, yes, no, we've got this whole bit, actually. Yeah, no, this will take a while. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I don't know. We might finish slightly early, but no, I had, for, to be honest, forgotten about this, but this, this bit will take a, a, a little while. Um, right, so we've done that. We're going to stick with the UI. Um, the next thing I want to show you is I want to show you how to lay out your own application. So up till now, we've concentrated on the um, sidebar layout. Um, there are loads of other built-in functions that I don't really have time to talk about. Uh, I will just briefly mention them at the end. Um, and there are like other whole entire ways. So for example, there's a package called Shiny Dashboard. It's quite popular. I use it a lot myself. Um, that makes Shiny look a bit more kind of modern and wizzy. Uh, so you might be interested in that. Um, I'm not going to show you any of the built-in stuff. I'm going to show you how to do your own because I think it's a useful skill. Once you've got this skill, you can sort of, it's like a do-it-yourself type approach. Um, and essentially, at its you know at its purest level it is quite simple so you lay out your whole application um with just two functions fluid rows which stack things on top of each other and columns which divide each row into sections so you might have a row and then you say i've got something here and something here and then another row and say this is like this and so on and so on and so on and each column can be made a different width and you can have as many columns as you like in one row, but they have to add up to 12. That's not shiny. That's This is all based on the Bootstrap. If you're interested, this is all from a, a web framework called Bootstrap. And that's where this concept of 12 comes from. Um, that's it. So let me show you. So this is an example of a, of a shiny application built entirely uh, with, with this thing. And as I mentioned, it's got that fluid page thing. I mentioned that right at the beginning. That does a lot of stuff that you want it to do so don't worry about too much about what's in there but if you miss that out it will not work it will be do something terrible um so as you can see here i've got two rows one here and one here and they just appear stacked on top of each other and then each row is itself divided using this width argument like this so these are six and six because they go up to 12 um and uh these are three and nine and you can see the output down here. So this is six wide and this is six wide. You can see obviously it's divided down the middle. Then this is a thin one and this is a thick one. There's a couple of salt to it, but I won't go into, but that's basically it. Uh, and using those basics, you can obviously build pretty much anything you want um, with a couple of, there's a couple of little tweaks that you can make here and there. Um, there's a question in the chat. What's the difference between well panel and box? Um, the similar to that question is I don't know. I don't think box is a shiny argument though. Is, it, is that not a shiny dashboard? Yes, I think you're probably thinking of shiny dashboard. Shiny dashboard has got that. Um, or maybe that's what you meant. Maybe you meant the whole time. Oh, I don't think I've even got it installed because I'm on the new version of R. Yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, I mean, they're very similar, basically. Uh, but one is shiny dashboard and it's a box and the other one is um, is just base shiny. And the, again, just to make this clear, just if you're interested in them, I don't, as I, said, I don't claim to be an expert in the web, really. I don't know much about it, but I come, I hear it here and there doing shiny. This well panel thing, this is also bootstrap. This is not shiny. This is this is a, this is been um, also made in the, in the in the bootstrap web framework. And they ported it in and it's just obviously this little gray thing it just allows you to kind of organize things a bit um right so that's how you do it um i'm assuming everyone's happy unless they say they're not um so what we're going to do now this is pretty much the end and then i'm just going to talk a bit about like deployment and servers and all that kind of thing at the end uh, so this is the last bit of shiny you're actually going to do and you just listen to me drone on a bit um we're gonna we're gonna lay it we're gonna bin the layout and start again uh do it yourself um so again let's let's bring up the um let's bring up the helping application stuff it's not on this slide is it 
No. Our course of deployments at the end of session three. I need to bring it up session three quickly. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, right, close this. Uh, file. Can't remember what we said now. What was it? Third. Bring up the third one. A and E code. Third, which is just here. I'm going to pop it out again. So, it's just this, basically. It's just a fluid row in two columns. Uh, simple as that. Um, so let's just do that. Let's make it work. So, it's going to go up to the UI. So this is the UI here. We can leave that title panel. That'll that'll be fine. Um, so this is the whole UI, uh, but we don't want sidebar layout. We're going to get rid of sidebar layout, and we're going to um, we're going to get rid of it. This is again, it's slightly unnatural because now I'm going to rewrite a UI in place. I don't think you'd normally do this. You'd obviously just build it from scratch the way you wanted it in the first place. But so that you have to forgive the slight unnaturalness of this. But I'm just going to just start typing underneath here. So we're going to port this into this. So the first thing to do is fluid write. And as I mentioned, this is quite a simple example because they all have to be simple, really. So this is just going to be one row, but you can have you can stack them on top of each other. So you know you can make this much more complicated than I'm showing you now, but it just gets very faffing with you know lots and lots of long code and all this kind of thing. So with the whole thing that we realized with one row and the first column, I think side by layer is roughly I haven't no, I haven't bothered to measure it. It's roughly three to nine, I think. So it's going to write column three. Meaning width equals three might be helpful actually if I just uh, write that just for your reference so you can see the arguments. Um, and then in this column is going to go everything that was in the sidebar panel. Uh, so all this stuff here. Oh no, we don't want the sidebar panel, we just want this, don't we? So you just want these two functions, a conditional panel and UI output are going to go here. Looking a bit messy now, isn't it? That's a bit better. Right, are we still right? Yes. Okay. So that's the fluid row with the first column in, width equals three. Now we're going to write a col comma, and we're going to put another column in. Column brackets nine, comma, and then this obviously is the outputs. So now we're going to pick up the tab set and all, pick up the whole thing piecemeal. And we're just going to put it in the column like that. And I'm getting a horrible mess with brackets and whatnot. No, I think we're right. So delete that. That's the thing about Shiny is brackets. Brackets can be, yeah, confusing. I might just put another return in there just to make it a bit simpler. Yeah, there we go. So I'm pretty sure right, so that's right. Incidentally, I can highly commend rainbow. I don't know if anyone's noticed. I can highly, if you haven't got rainbow parentheses, they are super useful in shiny because you can get the big messes like this. Uh, so it's, you know, if you haven't got that activated, I, I suggest you dig it out from the options and put it on because uh, it's not so important when you're writing analytic code, but when you write shiny applications, you can have a lot of brackets and like ty different types, you know, you can have multiple curly brackets even, so it can get a bit of a mess. Um, and again, as I mentioned, don't forget, just leave this fluid page where it is. That's that's doing a lot of work that's invisible to you. Um, and that's it, I think. So let's just see if I broke it. I've not had too many disasters, actually. This has been quite a good one. Um, oh, yeah, please select trust. I will. That error message is going to probably irritate me a bit, but never mind. Uh, let's just wind on a bit to there. And there it is. So you can see it looks very, 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 very similar indeed. We've lost the well panel. You could put that back in if you wanted to. I haven't I don't love it to be honest, that grey box. I think it, I well, is it ugly? I think ugly's probably putting it a bit stronger, but I, I don't love it myself. But you can put that back in if you want. Um and that's it. But obviously, yeah, at the point of showing you that isn't so you can recreate the same thing. The point of showing you that is that you can now make arbitrary user interfaces. You can have massive inputs or, you know, like 
lots of columns of outputs all along the side or you know like you can do whatever you like as long as it adds up to 12 you can do what you like <clears throat> right i'm just going to recap yeah so just to recap We've still got the fluid page. We've still got the title panel. They're both fine where they are. We're going to define one fluid row. You can have more than one and they stack on top of each other. And then we're just going to define using the width argument, uh, adding up to 12, what proportion it gets. And you just stick everything you want in here, in there, and it will just file down the screen. And anything you want on the right hand side, obviously, can be put here. In this case, it's the tab set panel. That's it. So that's a pretty powerful tool, that, um, and I've used it many times to build all sorts of uh, strange things. Sometimes the the sidebar panel is a bit is a bit um, limiting, shall we say? Um, right. Anything else? Anybody? Everyone? Okay. We've just got now. We've we've you've successfully completed session two as well. Um, so uh, how do have a look at session three in your own time, but I'm just going to skip right to the end of session three, because normally when I do this for a full day, I do the, um, I talk about deployment. I'm trying to do that now for those of you who are interested. Some of you probably won't be at this stage, but some of you will. So um, I'll just tell you about some of my experiences. to do right oh yeah and just to mention actually what the third session is about just for your interest it's mainly about um our markdown uh downloading our markdown files from shiny this is an incredibly powerful tool so do do dig into the code in 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 session three if you're interested um yeah, you can you can you know you can download our markdown reports with arbitrary values in them. So you can you know download your bit or your date or you know whatever that is. So that can be very very useful. Uh, I cover shiny dashboard as well. I go back and forth to whether I think that's a good idea or not. It's a cram package that that makes your application look different. Um, sometimes I think I shouldn't cover it because it's not really important because it's just basically a skin. Um, but it is really nice and it does do some extra little things as well. Um, and it is quite cool. So that's why it's in there. Um, but if you're the kind of person that's happy making ugly, shiny applications, you won't care about that bit. Um, right, so this is it. So we've got 17 minutes left, of which I probably won't use all of them, but I'm happy to kind of chat uh, at the end. Um, so deployment, making things work. And uh, my experience about this is all in the in in britain and the nhs i imagine there's people from all over the place uh, i imagine there's lots of people from america maybe lots of people who are not um so what i say will be more or less relevant to you i suppose depending on your exact circumstances you might work in an amazing place with all every you know data science gizmo imaginable and deployment is all one click um but you might not uh, so shiny does come it's worth saying i mean this is this is pretty amateur level but if you're just prototyping and testing i always encourage people to do this don't be put off by oh we've got to get this license and server and you know you do it lo-fi that can be a really good way of building support for what you're doing and that's what i did i was using shiny can't be 10 years ago because it only existed for 10 years whatever in version 0 0.6 i was using it um and i was doing all sorts of janky things that I wouldn't do now just to kind of show people and say, hey, look at this. This is, you know, you might want to kind of do more of this work. Um, so there's a run GitHub function. This is pretty amazing. So you just type run GitHub and you type the name of the repo and the name of the user. Um, and it just into the console, load the shiny library first, and it will just download the code and the data from GitHub and just run it. Um, so if you just want to just show someone, you know, that's just for like, hey, you know, and this is obviously for only for people who are happy using R. So if you want to just show someone something that's on your GitHub, just do that. Um, there's another nice thing that, that uh, Shiny includes as well, which is run URL. Uh, so you can use that with a zip. So you just get all your data and your code and whatever, bundle it all together in a zip, stick it on a web server somewhere. Um, 
and then you just write run URL and just point to that resource and it will just download it, unpack it and run it. Um, ditto run gist. I don't know if you're all familiar with gist. It's like a little thing that on GitHub where you can just show share like short files. It's not for big repos. It's just for like one or two bits and pieces. Um, and they all have an ID that's numerical. So you can just put that ID in and it will uh, automatically download the code and run that. Um, and the other thing you can do, and I, I don't know how obvious this is or not, I don't think it's completely obvious. If you're working on some sort of networked environment or you know, you're know you sharing a kind of you know, firewalled environment or whatever, you can just dump it somewhere and just get people to run it themselves. So if your users, if your other users are R users, there are actually loads of really easy, simple ways of sharing R with people. And actually that's, I think, pretty well catered for in China and quite easy to do. Um, as soon as you want to start interacting with people who are not our users, it obviously immediately gets more complicated. Um, so the shinyapps.io, I'm just mentioning that because it exists. I've never used it. I'm sure it's great, but I can't really say anything about it. That's the cloud service that our studio run. Uh, I'm sure it's great, but I, I confess I've never ever used it. I have no idea. Um, it's not great for us in, you know, I'm sure, and some of you probably been in the same session, in terms of like healthcare type data, because it is a cloud-based service, and particular for us, because it's a cloud-based service where the servers are in the US, there's a very limited type of data we can put on there. We can only put extremely safe demos on there, nothing else. Um, so that's that. Um, if you want to authenticate users, it gets more even more complicated again. There is a there is a, a free way of doing this called Shiny Proxy that I'm again just mentioning it because it exists. I don't know anything about it at all. I think it's Java. Um, I don't dare use it because if i said hey let's use shiny proxy to authenticate our applications and it didn't work properly um then i would be in a lot of trouble so i don't do that but you may be in a situation where you can or you want to investigate so do have a look if you if you want to um you can use proxy to authentication uh this is something i probably i guess i know slightly more about but to be honest i have never done this either um what you can do instead, if you've already got like a big web server type, like if it's all done already, and you've got all these people working on that kind of thing, then it's quite easy using Apache or Nginx or I'm sure lots of other things too, to just have proxy authentication where you don't authenticate to the shiny application, you authenticate to the web server that's in front of the shiny application. So that's quite simple. So you just, if you've already got people authenticating to a web server, just get them to authenticate and just don't let anybody through until they've authenticated and then all the shiny apps are behind. So that's really only helpful if you've got that big kind of setup already, which I have to say I don't. Um, but that obviously will work really, really well and shiny is very adaptable to situations like that. Um, so that's that. Uh, if you want to do it really simply, um, oh, these slides are showing their age, I suppose, slightly, because I think you certainly can't buy shiny pro anymore. Uh, whether they even support it, I don't, I don't know, because we let we, we haven't used Shiny Pro for a long time either. Um, as far as I know, and I'm happy to be corrected, there is only really one game in town for authenticating people um, uh, in a sort of, you know, super friendly cloud. Uh, well, not cloud necessarily. In a um, having a nice suite of applications, basically, that allows you to authenticate users to your Shiny applications, and that's our Studio Connect. Um, so we use our Studio Connect in my trust. Um, it's extremely brilliant. Uh, so we used to use Shiny Pro back in the day, um, and and it was fine in terms of like it worked as a server. It didn't crash or you know like it worked. But the problem with it was it was just hard for the data scientists or well or more specifically me because Shiny Pro you were really interacting with the Linux server. So you had to kind of FTP your files around, and there was no help with kind of package dependencies either. So if someone if someone changes their package version, doesn't tell you, and you're running different, so the, the server will only have one package on it. So we had a big problem. Someone upgraded their tidy art. I think it was me, actually. Um, and it just broke everything. And it took us ages to figure out what the problem was. Well, Connect doesn't do that, because Connect will save your exact package version information and deploy that. So you press a button, and it looks at your, your, your session and deploys that. Um, and it will deploy different versions of it will deploy different versions of R. It will deploy different versions of R, different versions of package. So the thing you deploy is the thing that's on your computer. So that's very very useful, and it's very easy to use. It's so easy to use that the people on my team who really just don't know about this stuff at all uh, can all use it quite happily. It's just basically just press a button once it, once it's been set up. It's all quite easy. Um, and just to mention, 
this difference just uh it's probably obvious to to some or all of you um but obviously there are two main ways of attacking this problem uh one's in the cloud and one's behind the firewall um being behind the firewall isn't necessarily more secure, but your organization might think it is in the sense that certainly where I am, there's a lot of sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt about the cloud and like, oh, you know, are people going to hack in and do all this stuff? I'm not sure that really modern methods really bear that out. Um, but all of our stuff, all of our sort of patient type stuff um, is all behind the firewall because then it's just it's it's kind of safe and tucked away. Um, so that can be another kind of upgrade route for you someplace. Perhaps you can get something working behind the firewall and then you can say, well, you know, let's, we want to kind of roll this out bigger really. So let's get a proper, you know, safe authenticated cloud environment and let's do all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of development work you can work up to. Um, I think that's everything department. Do I want to say anything else about, um, uh, oh yes. And just very, very quickly, again, probably fairly obvious, but just to, um, the main ways you're going to be loading data in Shiny is, I mean, I think when you start, you'll probably be loading CSV and .r data. Um, there is a pins package. Um, that's very, very useful, particularly if you're using Shiny, if you're using RStudio Connect. Uh, it allows you basically to have data resources that you just give them names and you just stick them on the server and then anyone can use them. So I could make a data object and just call it, you know, patient experience data. And then anyone else in my team, as long as they've got given permission obviously can then just go to the server and just fetch it by the name um and so again as i say before with shiny pro it was more a case of dumping data files on the server in the file system um whereas using the pins package with our studio connect uh it's a lot more of a nice clean experience where you just give the name of the object and it will just go and fetch it for you um and the other thing you can do of course is you can do sql SQL obviously is quite performant if you use it properly. So if you're using like if you're interacting using DB ply R, uh, it, 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 it will go pretty quickly because the computation is not being done on your server. It's been doing it on the SQL server. And so in my team, we, we do try as far as possible to do proper hardcore data processing, filtering, that kind of thing on the SQL server um, through the DB ply R interface and then bring it back to the shiny session. So we do as much as possible in SQL. And then w it's only the last bits that come over into the session and have run. And again, I'm mentioning that because what I said before about Shiny and you have to make sure your applications are quick and you have to make sure they don't take up too much CPU and RAM because you're sharing a server and all that kind of thing. And that's just more exercises. Right, so that's it. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, you've survived, so well done. Um, it's seven minutes early. I'm very happy to. Um, I mean, I would unmute you, if I, but it, I just think it's very complicated, isn't it? I mean, I suppose I could. If anybody really wants to say something, I can probably try and dig you out. But there's quite a lot of you. Um, there's no way self-contained shiny up to someone who's not an R user. No. The short answer to that is no. There, no, I'm sorry, there isn't. <laughs> it's it's a nuisance. Um, is it possible to build a web face form with Shiny? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I'm not sure that Shiny is the most natural language to do that in, to be honest, as I was saying right at the beginning about what is and isn't idiomatic in Shiny, but you most certainly could do that, yeah. Um, so yeah, as I say, do look at the GitHub repo. There's more. I haven't done it all. This is a full day course and I've compressed it into three hours. So uh, do, do go and have a look. You'll find me uh, on Twitter. At Chris Bean. I'll just pop that in the chat. Uh, you'll find me obviously on GitHub. So do you know if you've got any questions or want to talk about Shiny or anything at all, um, do um, do let me know. Uh, I'll just mention quickly my number one recommendation for when you get a bit better, a bit better, uh, is uh, Golem with modules. I'll just put that in the chat as well. I've got like a whole talk about how amazing Golem is, uh, but there's no time for that today. But as you develop, you might want to be uh, have, have, a look, have a look at that.
Uh, yes, Fallout theme chair. This was my lockdown present to myself. It was not cheap, to be honest, but it is very comfortable. I've fallen asleep in it several times, not while I'm working, I hasten to add. Um, yes, and I, I, I dearly love it. Oh, that's interesting. Ronnie Shine without a server. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that. So, yeah. I'll 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 take a note of that for the next time I do this talk. Interesting. Cool, okay, well I think we're all done. I was just hanging around just to see if there's any more questions, but I don't think there is. But as I say, do find me on Twitter or wherever. You'll uh, I'm I'm around. So uh, I think I can can I close the session? I think I'm co host. I'm not sure I can actually. <laughs>